Live recording is up. Sergeants, will you begin your recordings? PC recording good. Cloud is rolling. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Now, Sergeant Leonardo, you may begin to open. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place cell phones to silent or vibrate. If you have testimony that you wish to submit for the record, you may do so via email at testimony.council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Okay, bear with me one second. I'm just turning the comments. Good morning, everybody. I will we'll gavel in here. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this hearing on the City Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, we will be examining um, an oversight hearing on the effects of COVID-19 on the child welfare system in New York City. In March 2020, the child welfare system in nearly every, and nearly every other city agency and their programming was upended due to COVID-19 with school and social services agency closures, the number of abuse and neglect reports dropped significantly, resulting in a decline in caseloads for child protective workers and court filings by ACS. With the number of preventive cases dropping by over 22%, and the average caseloads for CPS workers dropping to 7.5 per workers who had previously had over 15 cases, um, and uh, according to the data released by city and state agencies, COVID-19 has impacted other key indicators across the child welfare system as well, leading to reductions in new preventive cases, supervision orders, and foster care admissions. In addition, abuse and neglect court filings also declined significantly between March and November of 2020 relative to 2019 data. In April 2020, case filings were down 67% and subsequently, in November 2020, filings were down by 41% as compared to the previous year. The number of children admitted to foster care declined by 53% in April 2020 compared to the previous year. And by September, foster care admissions were down by 24%. The pandemic has strained the existing challenges on children and families due to the family court closures, reduction in foster homes, and access to adequate resources for remote learning. While other agencies have taken steps to reduce the impact of the closures and disruptions to service for children and families, such as the expansion of telehealth and remote visits, we must ensure that we are that we turn the corner on the that as we turn the corner on the pandemic, with the vaccination effort underway and reopenings ongoing, that no families are left behind or overlooked. The committee will examine the impact of COVID-19 on the child welfare systems and specifically the data trends. Uh, during the pandemic for key indicators within the child welfare system and how young people and families in the system have fared during the disruptions and how the agency is managing the resumption of services and reopening. Um, I also uh, want to examine um, what we can learn um, from these indicators um, and how uh, we are able to challenge um, many assumptions that we uh, usually have on, um, on child welfare in New York City and um, and learn from this uh, very difficult experience. I wanna thank all the advocates and members of the public for joining us today. Thank you to representatives from the administration for joining us. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. 
At this time, I'd like to acknowledge um, committee staff who have worked on this, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, uh, Nicole Hunt, legislative director, as well as committee staff, Amanda Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omari, policy analyst, and Daniel Krupp, senior financial analyst. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today, council members Diaz, Grudenchik, and Land. And with that, I'll turn it uh, over to committee council. Thank you, Chair Levin. My name is Aminta Kilwan, Senior Counsel to the Committee on General Welfare at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, begin please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a delay of a few seconds before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the Administration for Children's Services, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. In order of speaking, we will have Commissioner of ACS, David Hansel, testifying. And for questions and answers, Julie Farber, Deputy Commissioner of Family Permanency Services, Dr. Jacqueline Martin, Deputy Commissioner of Prevention Services, William Fletcher, Deputy Commissioner of Child Protection, Alan Sputz, Deputy Commissioner of Family Court Legal Services, and Dr. Angel Mendoza, ACS Chief Medical Officer. I am now going to administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Hansel. I do. Thank you. Dr. Martin. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Farber. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Fletcher. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Sputz. I do. And thank you, Dr. Mendoza. I do. I do. Thank you all very much. I am now going to call on Commissioner Hansel for testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chair Levin, members of the Committee on General Welfare. Uh, I'm David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Um, and with me today are colleagues who Committee Council has just introduced, um, who I want to acknowledge for the work that they have done throughout the pandemic to keep children safe and families supported. We are deeply grateful to all of the ACS and our contracted provider staff who've worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic during times of fear, uncertainty, and personal challenge to carry out ACS's mission. I'd also like to take this moment to thank Chair Levin and the committee members for your steadfast leadership and partnership during this trying time. And I hope you will join me in recognizing and honoring the contributions of our dedicated ACS and provider agency staff who've persevered throughout the pandemic to meet the needs of children and families, often in new and innovative ways. I'm very pleased to be here today to speak with you about how ACS and our child welfare partners have and continue to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the long-term lessons we've been able to learn from this challenging and unpredictable time. In my testimony today, I'll first discuss how the pandemic has impacted our work quantitatively and then focus on how we've adapted our policies and practices to meet the health and safety needs of families and staff. And finally, I'll discuss some of the ways in which ACS and our partners are excited to contribute to the city's long-term recovery and share some of my thoughts on how I believe the pandemic may change the future of child welfare. While it's impossible to truly quantify the impact of the pandemic, we have been carefully monitoring our data in order to guide our work. Some of the key metrics that ACS monitors changed dramatically during the pandemic, including reports of alleged abuse or maltreatment to the statewide central register, family court filings, removals and placements of children in foster care and discharges of children from foster care. 
At the start of the pandemic in March and April 2020, reports to the state child abuse hotline dropped about 50% compared to similar spring reporting levels from prior years. The initial drop in reporting in late March and April of last year was largely due to reductions in reports from mandated reporters, such as school personnel, healthcare personnel, and law enforcement during the early days of the pandemic. Reports to the state SCR are now much closer to the levels we've typically seen in, in prior years. In March and April of this year, we received about 17% fewer reports than in March and April of 2019, and that difference continues to narrow. Throughout the pandemic, we've received a larger proportion of reports from non-mandated reporters, such as friends, neighbors, and relatives. When comparing the COVID-19 period of March 23rd, 2020 through February 28th, 2021, to the same period in the prior year, March 23rd, 2019 to February 28th, 2020, we find that pre-COVID-19, about a third of reports came from non-mandated reporters, while during the COVID-19 period, almost 50% of reports have come from non-mandated reporters, which tells us that New Yorkers are looking out for children who may be at risk of harm and taking steps to protect their safety. As I'll discuss in greater detail, the pandemic also drastically altered operations in family court. New York City has invested in a strong portfolio of prevention programs for families to help keep children safe at home. And through our new contracts in 2020, we scaled up successful practices to connect families with services early in a case and divert them from family court involvement. Prior to the current crisis in which the family court limited its operations, we had been reducing our utilization of court ordered supervision with a 23% decrease from calendar year 17 to calendar year 19. And in calendar 20 last year, we filed 33% fewer cases seeking court ordered supervision than in calendar year 2019. While this drop is certainly partially attributable to pandemic related court limitations, it also reflects significant changes in practice. In particular, our new model of early engagement of families in prevention services, which we piloted prior to the pandemic and brought to scale last year in our new prevention programs. Since the start of the pandemic, we've also seen the number of children entering foster care decline 38% compared to the 12 month period prior to COVID-19. With a significantly decreased family court operations, we also saw discharges from foster care declined 35% during the pandemic. In response, we developed new protocols to review cases of thousands of children in foster care to identify those who could progress toward reunification, even with limited court operations. Through these efforts, the foster care census has continued to decrease. Just prior to the pandemic, we announced that the foster care census was at an all time low of fewer than 8,000 New York City children in foster care. And this number has continued to decline and there are now fewer than 7,600 children in foster care. As I'll discuss in the next session of testimony, this data helped ACS to guide our work as we took many proactive steps to promote child safety and to provide families and communities with the services and supports that keep children safe. While our mission, and our critical child safety timelines never changed, the COVID-19 pandemic did require us to rethink the ways in which we carried out our core jobs of keeping children safe and families supported. This work occurred rapidly across all fronts, including the implementation of health and safety protocols, redoubling of our efforts to connect families with concrete information and services and resources, and adapting our support for families receiving prevention services as well as families with children in foster care. Significantly, the, panic impact, the pandemic impacted our work in family court. And I'll talk in more detail about our intensive and ongoing efforts to move cases and permanency planning efforts forward despite limited court availability due to COVID-19 health and safety measures. As always, the health and safety of staff and children and families we serve have continued to be our top priorities. We implemented targeted measures based on guidance from our national, state, and city health expert, experts, as well as the support and guidance of our own chief medical officer, Dr. Angel Mendoza. And I can't overstate how incredibly valuable it has been during the pandemic to rely on someone within the agency for credible health information and guidance. Throughout the pandemic, we've implemented protocols that aim to minimize COVID-19 transmission in our congregate care facilities, 
including increasing the frequency of cleaning, maintaining social distancing, and providing PPE for residents, and for ACS and provider agency staff, and for the families who we serve. We also adjusted our work to minimize health risks to children, families, and frontline staff, while continuing to ensure that children are safe from abuse or neglect and families are supported. For example, while our immediate child protective response for every reported case of suspected abuse or maltreatment since the start of the pandemic never stopped, we modified procedures for health reasons. Child protective staff ask health screening questions before entering families' homes, and we observe social distancing precautions when we meet with parents and observe children. We may also ask to see children outside of the home and use remote technology to speak with parents and other resources when these methods are sufficient to conduct our child safety assessments. We also leveraged our communications team to continuously maintain frequent and clear communication to assist both our workforce and the families that we serve. During this time, we enhanced our internal and our external websites to create repositories of information for ACS and provider agency staff and other stakeholders to easily address, which has helped reinforce the continuing health and safety protocols that we have in place. We've also used these tools to disseminate important information to all New Yorkers, such as the importance of social distancing measures and face covering, and of course, beginning this year, COVID-19 vaccinations, as well as information about the resources that were available to assist families during the pandemic. We've long been committed to earlier and better ways to keep children safe while keeping families together. And we continue to believe that the best way to do this is to provide families with the services and support that they need. For many families, COVID-19 has further highlighted the economic and social disparities in our city. Job loss, isolation, trauma, housing instability, health impacts, and other crises faced by families have compounded the need for social services to meet families' concrete needs. The movement toward a greater emphasis on prevention and especially primary prevention is more crucial than ever. Currently, ACS has three family enrichment centers that have been co-created with families and community members so that they truly represent responses to community identified needs. True to the program's purpose and the grassroots infrastructure of each center, the family enrichment centers have remained operational throughout the pandemic and continued to be trusted and reliable hubs of support, connections, and resources for children and families in their communities. During the pandemic, our family enrichment centers have offered virtual support to community members and have also provided food, clothing, and homework help to families. Additionally, many of our neighborhoods are rich in services and resources, but these supports may not be well known or easy for families to access. Our community partnership programs in 11 high need communities around the city have historically provided supports to families involved in the child welfare system. The partnerships have helped to connect all of the dots of services that exist so that families can learn about and gain access to the full continuum of supports available in their neighborhoods. Because of this existing mix of programs, we were able to quickly mobilize our network to reach families hit hardest by the pandemic. Those who got sick, lost their jobs, were in need of childcare, and were experiencing other challenges. These programs helped to deliver food, provide clothing and diapers, help families enroll in public benefit programs, offer transportation, helped keep families morale high by texting and calling to check in, offered virtual exercise classes and parent cafes, and hosted virtual events, including for holidays and summer camp. All of our core programs shifted to provide even more concrete resources to help families in need, including food, clothing, diapers, formula, pack and plays, and many, many more. In 2020, New Yorkers for Children and ACS established the COVID-19 Emergency Response Fund to address urgent needs arising from the pandemic among children, youth, and families involved with ACS. The fund's strategic partnership with philanthropy and individuals has helped raise and disperse more than a million and a half dollars in support of vulnerable youth and families, reaching more than 3,000 youth parents, foster parents, and other caregivers since April 2020. We also collected more than $3 million in in-kind donations to distribute to families and youth, including clothing, winter coats, diapers and wipes, essential care items, backpacks, and many, many more. 
As part of our early and ongoing efforts to help families and youth impacted by the pandemic, we launched campaigns through social media and radio advertisements to communicate a variety of information and resources to all New Yorkers. Coping Through COVID is our resource page aimed at helping families through the pandemic and Teens Take On COVID is targeted to providing resources to teens, many of whom are struggling with social isolation and some of whom may be experiencing violence at home. Considering the extended amount of time that families have remained at home, ACS's child safety campaigns have focused on helping parents to avoid tragic accidents and create safer home environments. For example, by learning about infant safe seat practices, how to store medication and cleaning supplies out of the reach of children, and the importance of installing window guards. Our current and most recent child safety campaign, Look Before You Lock, is aimed at reminding parents to never leave a child alone in a hot car. We believe that the best way to keep children safe is to provide families with the support and the services that they need. We do this through both primary prevention services that I discussed, as well as our nationally recognized prevention services continuum. We serve about 20,000 families, including about 41,000 children annually through prevention services to support and strengthen families and keep children safely at home. Whenever possible and following COVID-19 health and safety protocols, our prevention and our homemaking providers have continued to deliver in-person services to families during the pandemic. Providers make family-specific determinations about whether to meet with families in person based on assessed risk to child safety and well-being that the service is intended to address, balanced with any current COVID-19 related health risks. Providers have used personal protective equipment and consistent screening to manage health risks to both families and staff, and have also used televisits to conduct ongoing and regular contacts with families and children, particularly when COVID-19 health risks existed for families. In addition to routine contracts, contacts, ACS has encouraged providers to have frequent interim contact with families by telephone or other electronic communication means to combat isolation and offer additional support. We launched a telehealth tips website for families, providers, and advocates to guide and support the use of telehealth services. For many families, especially those who may be isolated during this stressful time or who may be experiencing serious mental health challenges or who are survivors of intimate partner violence, the reassurance of hearing regularly from a supportive case planner cannot be overstated. Despite the many unprecedented emergency demands last spring, through the perseverance of ACS staff and our contracted provider partners, we were able to launch our redesigned prevention services system with 119 new contracts in place on July 1, 2020. Our new system is now fully in place and operational. It's continuing to grow and thrive, increasing families served by 33% in just the first 10 months. From the start of the pandemic, we recognized how challenging it was for both children and their parents when children were in foster care during the pandemic. Fears for each other's health and safety and the restrictions on seeing loved ones in person during the height of the pandemic, which created a difficult time for all New Yorkers, were compounded for parents and children, uh, children and youth in foster care. Placement of children with foster caregivers who are relatives, friends, or other trusted adults is known to reduce trauma and help speed permanency. And we've seen the percentage of placements with family members and close family friends increase even during the pandemic, with more than half of the children entering foster care during the past fiscal year being placed with kinship caregivers. By continuously strengthening our work to identify and support kinship caregivers, we've been able to achieve an overall increase in the proportion of the city's foster care children who are with kinship caregivers from 30% in 2017 to more than 42% in 2020. We've consistently emphasized that family time and communication between children in foster care and their parents are essential to supporting children's well being, to minimizing trauma, and to, speedy to speeding the timeline toward reunification. We collaborated with our providers to ensure that all children, youth, and parents had access to electronic devices that would allow for virtual visits, including that foster care agencies have purchased phones and phone plans for youth parents, parents and foster parents when they were needed. 
We provided detailed guidance to our providers about how to carefully review and weigh child safety needs and the family's potential health risks when determining if contact should be held in person or virtually. Furthermore, the guidance makes clear that agencies cannot have blanket visitation policies, but rather that decisions must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. The vast majority of visits are now occurring in person. And moving forward, we think there's opportunity for virtual visits to supplement and enhance the time that children in foster care can have to connect in person with their families, further strengthening communication and relationships. Ensuring that the children and youth in, in our care have access to high quality educational services is always a crucial priority for ACS, but it required extra attention and partnership during the pandemic. Starting in spring 2020, we partnered with the DOE to provide thousands of young people in foster care with remote learning devices. Continuing to this school year, ACS has continued to work closely with DOE staff to expedite delivery for children and youth newly entering care who required devices. ACS and providers have also furnished students with tablets and desktop computers when needed while students awaited arrival of their DOE, advice, DOE devices. In addition, ACS and DOE have collaborated to enhance the capacity of foster care agency staff to support students in foster care with remote and hybrid learning, offering a series of provider trainings on how to assist families in navigating remote learning technology. We've also partnered on a series of successful informational sessions about remote and hybrid learning for both foster parents and parents of students in foster care. As we approach the end of a school year like no other, I want to commend and congratulate every student and every caregiver for the dedication and perseverance it's required to achieve educational goals during this challenging time. During this difficult period when youth and families lost jobs due to the pandemic and the economic downturn in the city, we ensured that more than 1,300 paid internships and jobs were available to youth in the foster care system. We also helped youth build their skills through a variety of certified industry-specific trainings linked to immediate jobs in professional services, building trades, and social services sectors. We developed these opportunities in, in collaboration with DYCD, with the Center for Youth Employment in the Mayor's Office, the Robin Hood Foundation, and the Pinkerton Foundation. Our programs serve youth ages 16 to 24 in foster care or formerly in care, including youth attending college and those who are disconnected from school or work. Since April 2020, when we launched our first, our highly successful series of virtual career fairs, over 300 youth have attended and we've helped connect many youth who are in foster care or transitioning out of foster care to meaningful private sector jobs that have great training programs, college tuition reimbursement programs, and strong career pathway opportunities. Additionally, through Fair Futures, thousands of young people in foster care ages 11 to 21 are receiving coaching, tutoring, educational advocacy and support, assistance with planning for housing, and access to regular, supportive guidance as they achieve important life milestones. We know that Fair Futures coaches and tutors have been tremendous supports to young people throughout the pandemic. The mayor and ACS remain committed to the Fair Futures program as an important model to promote well-being and good outcomes for youth in foster care. On March 18, 2020, the New York State court system essentially suspended in-person operations when the governor issued an executive order that closed most offices and buildings and suspended speedy trial laws across the state. Much of this executive order remains in place today. On March 25th, 2020, the New York City Family Courts began very limited virtual court proceedings and then to begin very limited in-person proceedings for pro se litigants. With some exceptions, the courts have been hearing cases described as essential and emergency court matters, including applications where ACS seeks immediate safety interventions for children who are at risk of harm, such as court ordered removal and or orders of protection. When the family court moved to a virtual platform in March of last year, our family court lawyers and support staff adapted to telework almost overnight. Fortunately, we already had a system in place to file our petitions electronically with the court. 
We'd also made a significant investment in technology before COVID-19 so that every family court lawyer already had an ACS laptop with cellular service. And this was instrumental for our attorneys to seamlessly gather information and appear in virtual court proceedings. There have been many challenges to resolving more cases through virtual court process, including, these are just some of them, technology for partners and witnesses, the need for more clerical staff for the family court, and initially a need for more court reporters for the virtual court because pre-pandemic, much of the court reporting work was handled by digital tape recorders. We've seen modest steps to increase the capacity and capability of the courts to hear cases virtually, but there is still a significant backlog from when the courts stopped hearing its calendar of regularly scheduled hearings uh, in Mar on March 18th, 2020, and was not able to begin scheduling many of these matters until the fall of last year. Since January of this year, the family court began providing increased court access by creating dedicated virtual links for every courtroom citywide, and it enhanced capabilities for these courtrooms to implement a recording system for proceedings. With these two developments, we've experienced increased virtual court activity, although it remains well below pre-pandemic levels. Given the limited operations of the family court during the pandemic, we were extremely concerned about the impact this would have on the pace of family reunification. As a result, we took aggressive action to implement strategies outside of the normal court process. Since the pandemic began, ACS and our foster care providers have proactively reviewed the cases of 4,000 children and worked with parents and children's attorneys to determine if cases could move forward with increased and or unsupervised visiting, with predisposition release, trial discharge, or final discharge. In cases where all parties agreed that the case should proceed, our family court attorneys worked with the parents and, children, and children's attorneys where necessary to sign stipulations and submit these agreements to the court for approval. This process has helped move reunification cases forward even without the court holding hearings. We've also worked with our foster care agencies so that adoption and kinship guardianship cases that are ready to proceed as soon as the court calendars these matters are in fact able to proceed. We have found that these proactive reviews are beneficial in expediting the reunification process. And so ongoing, we will be working with our providers and attorneys to incorporate this into our regular case practice. Last week, we issued our RFPs to re-procure and redesign foster care services, including both family foster care and residential care. These RFPs are the result of extensive research and input from youth, parents, foster parents, advocates, provider agencies, child welfare experts, and other stakeholders. The vision for our redesigned foster care system builds upon the progress already made to strengthen that system, including reducing the number of children in foster care to a historic low, reducing the length of time children stay in foster care, reducing the use of residential care, placing a greater proportion of children in foster care with family and friends, and expanding services for children and youth in care. The redesigned system will strengthen foster care services in a number of ways. First, it will require and fund foster care agencies to hire parent advocates with lived experience of the child welfare system to help parents safely reunify with their children more quickly and to improve race equity outcomes. Every parent working towards reunifying with their children will have an assigned parent advocate to partner with them throughout the process. Second, the redesign system will significantly increase therapeutic and evidence-based supports to better meet children's needs while they're in foster care. And third, the redesign system increases resources and expands the use of proven practices across the system in key areas, including visiting, continuing to increase the proportion of children placed with family and friends, expediting reunification and providing services and supports to youth in care, such as coaching and tutoring. And now to the future. Like so much of our city's recovery, our next phases critically depend on the COVID-19 vaccine. And we have actively encouraged our workforce and the children and families we serve to be vaccinated. As soon as vaccines became available to New Yorkers, we successfully advocated to the state and the city for essential direct service staff at ACS and our contracted providers to be prioritized for vaccination in early January. 
We've taken a number of steps to encourage and help staff to get vaccinated. We regularly share important health-related information about the vaccine in staff emails and on our agency intranet site. We created a weekly Ask Dr. Mendoza column where our chief medical officer answers staff questions about vaccines. And this information is also on our website for providers. Dr. Mendoza, as well as other prominent leaders such as Anthony Wells from SSEU Local 371, participated in a town hall to answer questions and share experiences about their choice to become vaccinated. And earlier this spring, we operated a vaccine pod at our headquarters building where nearly a thousand staff and family members were vaccinated. As for young people, of course, now young people aged 12 and up are eligible uh, to be vaccinated. And so we and our provider agencies are working to obtain the necessary parental consents and vaccine appointments for the eligible youth in our care. ACS developed detailed guidance for providers on how to approach the various and sometimes complex consent situations for youth in foster care. We also disseminated fact sheets to the providers and aided their efforts to educate youth about the vaccines. We're creating and promoting educational materials for youth so that they can learn about the vaccine and make informed decisions about getting vaccinated. In fact, this spring, we hosted an Instagram live event with Erica Francois from the Fair Futures Youth Board. In addition to focusing on vaccines for all eligible New Yorkers who want one, including those who we work with and serve, it's critical that we focus on recovery efforts on the communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Families in these communities have particularly felt the economic and social impacts of COVID-19, including devastating job loss, trauma, housing instability, health impacts, and other crises. We know that these same communities have long been burdened by the pernicious effect of direct and systemic racism. And this is the moment to confront and address that painful legacy while meeting current family needs to connect with concrete services and supports. In this regard, the movement toward greater emphasis on prevention and especially primary prevention is more crucial than ever. Just last month, Mayor de Blasio announced that we will be expanding from three family enrichment centers to 30 over the next four years. The FECs will be located in neighborhoods that the Mayor's Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity has identified as those hardest hit by COVID-19 and that have historically experienced other service health and social disparities. The new FECs will build on the success of the initial three as community hubs co-administered by nonprofit organizations and the communities themselves. Just like the initial three FECs, the new FECs will be specifically tailored to provide the services, supports, and social connections that each individual community feels they want and they need. Also, as I testified in our executive budget hearing, we are implementing a bold new plan to increase access to low cost federally funded childcare vouchers for thousands of additional families with a number of measures to expand access. We're prioritizing childcare access for families who are experiencing homelessness, families who have recently participated in any of our child welfare programs, and families who need post-transitional childcare as they're transitioning off other public assistance benefits. We're also seeking state approval for a demonstration project to target high need families in the task force communities. When families and communities build their protective factors and have access to needed resources, children will be safe and families will be stable without traditional child protective system interventions. There's no question that this pandemic will have a profound impact on all of our lives. And there are many lessons that we have learned and reflections on a pre-COVID time that now seems so distant which I believe will change the future of child welfare. And some of these are, I'd like to itemize here. First of all, increasing opportunities to proactively resolve courses, court cases outside of the court process. The success of the proactive reviews of family court, court cases that I described suggests that we should pursue future opportunities to collaborate with providers and attorneys to resolve cases and move families toward reunification without a court appearance. Second, increasing opportunities to address safety issues without court intervention by continuing to reduce the use of court-ordered supervision. 
During the pandemic, when our ability to file court order supervision cases in family court has been limited by the court's emergency restrictions, we expanded upon our model of early engagement and prevention services to provide children with services and promote child safety. As we move forward, we're committed to continuing this and other strategies to reduce utilization of court ordered supervision. Third, determining whether and how best to make use of virtual visits, casework contacts, and court appearances. While video will never replace in person interactions, there are clearly some benefits. For families involved in the court system, for example, fewer in person court ex uh, experiences on court ACS cases, as well as other kinds of family matters like child support, could benefit parties who would not need to take time off from work or find childcare for the day while they spend that day in court. In addition, Video visits can be a good supplement, if not a replacement, for parent-child visiting and family time, as it can allow more frequent and flexible communication. Fourth, maintaining access to telehealth. We've heard positive feedback, especially from young people, about telehealth for health and mental health services. While not all services can or should be virtual, this is something with potential to build on, which will require more permanent approvals of Medicaid reimbursement. Fifth, we must address the digital divide. COVID-19 has also showed the clear impact of the digital divide and the need to make sure all families have access to the internet and the technology that so many of us now rely on. And from a system perspective, COVID-19 lays bare the need for government services, agencies, nonprofits, social service providers, lawyers, courts, and principally families to have access to and to be able to leverage technology. Sixth, we must address economic stability. For many families, COVID-19 has further heightened the economic and social disparities in our city. Job loss, isolation, trauma, housing instability, health impacts, other crises faced by families have compounded the need for social services to meet families' concrete needs. The full impact here has not yet been fully realized and is something for which we all need to prepare. And in this regard, our movement toward greater emphasis on prevention and especially primary prevention is more crucial than ever. And seventh, addressing racial disproportionality. Finally, COVID-19 has brought to the forefront of our attention, the systemic inequities families and children of color face. The pandemic has disproportionately impacted these communities and we must galvanize to both address the systemic racism in our country and our city and meet the needs of families. As we look forward to the day when COVID-19 is behind us, there are important lessons learned that will continue to inform and improve our child welfare policies and practices. We appreciate the council's continued support as we carried out our work under challenging circumstances. Thank you again to all of the ACS staff, prevention staff, foster care staff, who selflessly supported the children and families of New York City over this past year. Thank you, and we are happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge additional council members that have joined us. Um, council members, Lan um, I mentioned Diaz, Bredenchik, and Lander. We've also been joined by council members Reynoso and Gibson. Um, Commissioner, I, I appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to acknowledge uh, as well the um, uh, the amazing uh, work of of everybody in the agency um, and in the foster care agencies and um, and uh, parent advocates and parent attorneys. Everybody that um, has had to adapt so uh, significantly in the last um, fifteen months. It's been um, uh, um, it's been a trying time for obviously everybody in our city um, um, with the stakes as high as they are in um, ensuring the safety of children. It's, um, uh, I imagine that that has been um, uh, you know, significantly additionally stressful um, and I want to acknowledge their work and also uh, acknowledge that they, um, uh, that there will be an extended period of time in which they may experience some after effects of that traumatic experience and, and we should be keeping an eye out for that. Um, 
So, uh, Commissioner, my, my first question, I, I kind of want to take a generalized question at first is, you know, at the, um, at the outset of COVID and, and for the first few months, um, uh, you know, there's this, I, I had a significant concern that, um, you know, what if we're missing cases um, that of, of significant um, uh, maltreatment uh, for children that uh, would have uh, otherwise been caught by a mandated reporter. So at school or uh, you know, a, a, a school nurse or teacher or other school personnel or some, uh, some other person that might have an interaction with the child outside the home. So the thought of a child um, uh, being um, uh, maltreated you know, for an extended period of time with no access to the outside world was, you know, I, 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 um, you know, I, it's, I certainly lost some sleep over that um, that thought, and um, and and we saw with with the indicators that we have the significant decrease in in calls the SCR from mandated reporters, um, uh, and um, but on the but on the other hand. Um, we, you know, I think many people that have worked within the child welfare system over the years um, have been advocating for less, you know, for, 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 for less um, uh, reports to the SDR and to, um, um, to not kind of have that be the default um, um, way that we interact with one another to call the SCR whenever there's a suspicion um, because of uh, the myriad of, of impacts that that has on a, on, a, on a family's life in the future. And we've covered that many times where we're continuing to, um, to look at those impacts in this committee. Um, what has the data shown us so far about um, whether there's, whether are there any clear indicators that the significant reduction in reports to the SCR meant that we were missing cases of abuse in a city? Yeah, um, Chair, that's a very important question. And it's one that we have been spending an enormous amount of time um, thinking about analyzing data on um, because it was, it was a, I think, really a national concern. Like, what, what does this mean uh, for, for, for children and safety of children? Um, I guess I would, well, let me first by talk a little bit about the things that we did, given at the beginning, we didn't know, of course, you know, it was sort of a, something we, we couldn't, we couldn't know, it was an unknowable, um, but we knew it was reality in the first couple of months. Now, as I said in my testimony, it was a reality really only for the first couple of months, and we actually saw the level of reports to the SCR uh, really begin to normalize significantly, even by the summer of 2020. So it was a fairly short period of time, uh, number one, um, but it was, a, it was still a concern. And so we did a number of things uh, to try to um, minimize the possibility that might be the case. Um, first of all, while we, we did see an overall uh, decline in reports from mandated reporters, as I mentioned, as, and as you uh, just mentioned, um, we did work um, very closely with the other service systems that typically um, are, are significant reporters of, uh, of child maltreatment. The schools, obviously, principally, and also the healthcare system. So we worked very closely with DOE, uh, beginning actually in April of 2020, and then again when the school year started uh, in September, to issue uh, guidance, which they issued, but in close consultation with us, to teachers and other school staff about what to look for during remote learning, what, what, what is and what is not an appropriate reportable uh, suspicion of child abuse or neglect. We did not want school staff or teachers reporting things like technology problems um, that are issues, but they are not child welfare issues. They're issues for the schools to work uh, closely with parents and families to address. So we, we issued guidance uh, to make sure that teachers and other, and other uh, school personnel, even during remote and hybrid learning, remain vigilant about what should be reported as, as possible maltreatment. Um, we work closely with the healthcare system, especially the hospital system, um, again, about what should and should not be reported, making distinctions uh, there. Um, and so uh, we worked actually 
uh, closely with uh, both health and hospitals and DOHMH on guidance about what should and should not be reported in the maternity setting, for example, that uh, uh, a positive uh, toxicology result, for example, on a parent or uh, a mother or child in itself was not, should not be the basis for an SCI report, only concerns about a child's well-being. So we, we tried to make sure that, that mandated reporter systems remain vigilant. Um, we launched uh, informational campaigns, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, to make sure that families knew where to get resources because we knew that people were very isolated, uh, parents and young people. And so we launched our, uh, our informational campaigns. Um, and we saw, as I said, one of the things that we did see, which I think was a, a positive sign, was that uh, proportionally we did receive more reports coming from non data reporters, which you know, given that, that children were spending more time at home um, was likely to be the locus of, uh, of, um, of observation. So uh, we were actually heartened that we saw a larger proportion of cases coming from family members, community members, neighbors, friends, and so on, who were paying attention to, to child safety. So there are a number of things that we did to protect against that. Um, and then as time went on, we really were able to monitor data. And I'm happy to say that we really haven't seen any indicators uh, of uh, you know, a larger um, uh, bolus of, of undetected uh, child abuse. We haven't seen, for example, uh, significant changes in emergency room usage that might, you might think would happen if there were more children uh, suffering any kind of serious uh, physical abuse. Um, we haven't seen changes in our indication rate for cases significantly. Um, so we really don't see any indication of that. And in fact, um, I think one might just as well uh, posit, although again, we don't really know, it's, they're both hypotheses, that um, it could be a, a very positive thing for children to be spending more time with their parents at home. It does mean that there needs to be more focus on potential household risks to children. And that's why, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have really been expanding our informational campaigns for parents and caretakers about how to avoid risk to children in the home because children have been spending a lot more time at home. Um, so uh, you know, there are a number of things that we did to try to offset any possibility that might be the case. Um, but I'm happy to say, and very relieved to say, we haven't seen any indication, at least in New York City, um, that that's the case. Um, thank you, Commissioner. That's, uh, that's, that's helpful. Um, with regard to, um, I'll jump back to that in a second, but with, with um, with regard to um, um, the support that we give for families during that time or in this past year, as we've seen, you know that, that the increase in, in time at home um, for children. What is the what are the resources that we've um, proactively given to families um, in a um, both in a generalized sense. Um, in terms of uh, outreach and then through the uh, prevention system, primary prevention system around mental health. I could say, um, um, you know, I've, I have two young children, four and two. Um, I've been here for the last 15 months with them um, and it's stressful, uh, very stressful um, to, be, um, uh, to, to be home with children um, all the time. Uh, and, um, and so there's, um, there's increased, um, uh, potentials for, just, um, uh, you know, just stressful interaction. Um, what type of outreach has ACS done proactive to reach out to parents in that regard? Yeah, uh, again, very important question. And let me say a few words and, and then I'd like to turn it to um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher and Deputy Commissioner Martin to talk about how we, as we've interacted with families, uh, either in the uh, child protective process or in the prevention system, uh, how we've addressed, identified and addressed mental health concerns. This is always uh, an issue for us. And as you're absolutely right, the levels of stress during COVID uh, have been off the charts for many families and so have really um, increased uh, mental health concerns. And um, addressing mental health issues has always been a core part of our, um, uh, of our work. Um, and we do it uh, really from the beginning of our interactions with, as we, you know, when we uh, receive a, a report from the SCR and begin our involvement with the family, 
one of the things we're looking for is whether there are in fact mental health concerns uh, that need to be addressed. And if so, uh, how we can connect families with the right services, either through our prevention system or through other uh, resources that exist in the community, of which there are many. Um, so it's something we're always attentive to, um, but have been even more so during COVID. And um, if I can, let me turn uh, actually first to uh, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher and then uh, Deputy Commissioner Martin. And actually, um, uh, Dr. Mendoza may want to speak to this as well because uh, mental health services are within his purview um, and he actually oversees a lot of our relationships with the provider system. So let's, let me start with, uh, with uh, William. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, um, Chair Member Levin, you know, for elevating this. It has been a challenge, uh, especially for our frontline specialists, um, many of them themselves concerned for families who now, because of the pandemic, need, needing to shelter in place, making sure that their mental health and well-being was, was at the forefront and paramount. And, you know, so our CPS or our specialists, you know, receive, even pre-pandemic, receive specialized training around mental health and identifying the indicators and cues so that they can definitely and immediately match families who may be experiencing mental health challenges or concerns. Um, they look at the impact of mental illness on parenting capacity, the impact of parent mental illness on children, on a regular basis. They even look at the stigma surrounding mental illness and the legal issues that may ensue. Um, because if we deem that the child's parental capacity is very low, we may need legal intervention so that the family can get what they need. Um, I think one of the great efforts that we've made, which is a great accomplishment, which our commissioner um, outlined um, during his testimony, um, is coping during COVID. Um, I think that's important and that's the information that we shared with families as we were out there when families expressed, Chair Levin, that they were um, at wit's end and challenged by sheltering in place with, with their children. So we were able to have that app on our, our cell phones or our tablets and we were able to share that information with families and sh also helping them to access it from their devices as well. Um, the other thing is um, making sure that families have resources, the re that resources are available, even though many of them um, were also working um, virtually, but just matching um, integrated um, services for parents and children. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why our specialists and our um, contracted agencies wanted to make sure that they were present and that they were out there um, so that families would not feel disconnected and that we were able to at least connect with families and assess needs and then connect them with the right services um, to make sure that their well-being was always um, at the forefront. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Martin, um, to add. Hey, good morning, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you so much for uh, putting this question, uh, you know, for us to, to spend a few minutes reflecting on. Uh, you know, as the commissioner said, uh, you know, we understand that this last year has been uh, incredibly challenging time for our families, um, especially uh, those who were dealing with the effects of uh, COVID-19. You know, we know that there was um, an impact, the economic downturn. We know that, uh, you know, we just saw so many issues exacerbated uh, by the crisis. And each of these traumas uh, can have an impact on family functioning and stability. And this is why uh, from the prevention services perspective, uh, you know, we offer trauma-informed uh, services that are geared toward helping families uh, strengthen and provide and, and, and strengthen their community connections. Um, all of our models in prevention services connect families to not only the trauma-informed service that they need at a moment, but also the concrete 
goods and services that they might need, not to underestimate that, right? Because uh, before families will participate in any sort of therapeutic treatment, uh, we need to meet their basic needs. And so our continuum um, that, as the commissioner mentioned, that we launched in 2020, our new prevention services uh, contracts, we now have the opportunity uh, for the first time where we are offering um, a significant percentage of clinically uh, therapeutic-based services for families to meet their uh, mental health and other complex needs, whether that is dementia domestic violence, whether that is substance abuse, uh, you know, these services are there in a combination for families to access based on their needs. So as we're offering more therapeutic capacity than ever before, uh, you know, we are providing families across the city with the opportunity to address either directly through our services or to connect them through referrals to mental health and other services that will meet their needs. So, this is through the primary prevention system is what you're referring to or, no, or through uh, normal preventive? Normal, pre normal preventive okay. or, or secondary tertiary prevention service system. Yeah. Yes. So Sorry, I, go, go on, go on. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I also want to mention that when we recognize at the height of the pandemic that we would need to also provide, uh, you know, our, our prevention service system with tools, right, to help them make that shift um, to a more telehealth oriented service uh, intervention. Um, and as a commissioner mentioned, one of the tools that we actually created, and I'm really proud of this, because it was a cross-agency development. So we worked with uh, the New York um, Department of Health and uh, Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunities, and the Public Policy Lab. And we, we collaborated very early on um, to create a telehealth tips, uh, which is really designed to guide and support the use of telehealth during COVID-19. Um, this guidance is, is meant for not only the providers, but also for families um, and advocates to address these needs. So we are, we are really thinking about this very holistically, not only the services that families need, but what do we need to do in order to help them uh, really access those services uh, in real time. Um, I think you know, because uh, we, we've uh, talked about this before, you know, our Gabby program and those services has continued to be there in community for families uh, that are receiving prevention services. And we know one of the indicators uh, that, uh, you know, puts children at risk is isolation. When their parents are isolated, um, as you mentioned, you know, the, the stressors of COVID-19 just really, uh, you know, elevate uh, some of those stressors. And our Gabby services, which is a group attachment based intervention, uh, have always has been remained open, offering parents the opportunity to either come into the group space, come into the centers, or to have those um, contacts uh, with families and children and provide them with that service virtually. So uh, we've continued to just sort of, you know, be mindful of the fact that our responsibility is supporting families and reducing the risks of harm to children. Um, and so we're really proud of the fact that our contracted providers and their staff have continued to just uh, meet and orient themselves to the needs of children and families uh, during this time. I'll, I'll ask, uh, turn it over to Dr. Mendoza and see what else he'd like to add. <laughs> yes, very, very little. Thank you, Dr. Martin. <laughs> um, very, very little to add, but I do want to emphasize the, the importance of telehealth. And one of the most important things that you can do about telehealth is you can do um, mental health visits and mental health treatment at time of need and on site. And one of the difficulties that we always have with uh, providing uh, mental health and behavior health uh, related services is that they're not necessarily available on site and not necessarily available at a time of need. Telehealth actually helped very much to overcome that barrier. And yes, um, we continue to, we have advocated with the state and with the city 
to yeah. have this available to um, all of our families and we will continue to advocate to have this available going forward even um, even once we uh, really turn the corner on COVID, which I hope will be very, very soon. I also want to mention two other things. One is that um, this, uh, the time of COVID has really allowed us to develop very, very good, close collaborative relationships with our partners, such as health and hospitals. Um, we, we will probably have another opportunity to talk about the family health program at some point that is um, really geared towards our prevention, uh, our families in prevention, our families in child protection and our families in foster care. But just suffice it to say is that uh, during this whole uh, pandemic, during this whole crisis, we've been working very, very closely with leadership in health and hospitals to pay attention to the health needs, mental health needs, and even non-mental health needs of our families. In need. And they have been very, very good partners in this. I can give you some specifics when we have a, more opportunities later on. And then um, thirdly, I would like to mention also um, our collaborative relationships with DOHMH. The health department has been very, very forthcoming with what available resources and services can be made available to our families. Uh, we participate, ACS participates in all of their used to be weekly uh, webinars. It's now by weekly webinars, but part of what happened there was that they had some sessions that were specifically geared towards uh, focusing on attending on and addressing mental health needs during the time of COVID, whatever resources were made available through those webinars and through other collaborative meetings we've had with DOHMH, we immediately shared with leadership in foster care, with leadership in child protection and with prevention. Dr. Mendoza, can I just ask, a, 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 because you're a physician, um, uh, if you could, and the chief medical officer at ACS, if you could speak to what, what is, what um, is the call I mean, from a kind of, physical or physiological perspective, what's the cause of that increase in stress that parents might feel? Um, and um, and what are what are some of the, the ways that we're um, conveying to, to parents that they deal with it? Um, are you specifically referring to what stressors could be added because of the pandemic, because of COVID? Yeah, I mean, and how is that, how is that manifesting in kind of our, I mean, as a parent, you know, Noticing is it, is it cortisol levels that go up? What is the what are the things that are happening um, that that make um, uh, parents more stressed out? Uh, yeah. From situations like this. Yeah, you actually mentioned cortisol, which is a huge part of it. I mean, part of the um, the anxiety that um, really over overwhelming parents at this point is, especially in the very beginning, was really not being able to deal with the unknown. Um, and so even when parents go into, so you mentioned cortisol, so you're going to a fight or flight um, situation, right? Um, in the past, when parents were met with certain situations in which they had to protect their children, they at least knew what to do because they knew what to expect. In this case, the biggest factor really was the, was the unknown. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't have the resources um, for, for treatment or prevention, really. And that's, that's just admitted in the beginning. We did not have any of these resources. So with parents, they went into this um, chronic um, hyper anxiety, kind of hyper vigilant mode. And so in, in, in order for, for example, to then help their families, help their children cope with something like this, they have to get out of that mode, about that hyper vigilant mode, they could not get themselves out of that themselves. And so it was harder for them then to offer that support to their children who are also in that hypervigilant mode. Now, when parents are, um, we already know this, that when parents are at a high anxiety levels, even when the children don't know why, they immediately again feel that hyper anxiety mode that their parents feel. And so this is all multiplying the parents feeling that, the children feeling that, and the parents not really have all of the resources they should have at their disposal in order to cope with the need. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm even on an ongoing basis, it's, you know, as we're coming, kind of coming back into some semblance of normalcy within our, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that, the legacy of that and any of the kind of post-traumatic uh, aspects of that, um, because, um, you know, again, as a parent with young kids, I recognize um, that it's, 
it's been, you know, especially hard for parents this past year um, um, to manage their, their own lives, their livelihoods, um, external stressors um, mixed then with, you know, being with your kids in a house for, or an apartment for um, 24 hours a day for extended periods of time stressful yeah, I mean parents are used to one of the things too that, that, that added to the stress the parents were used to their children going to school during the day and now they have to deal with children having to be there with them 24 7 so they did not really have the ability to then kind of cope and have that have the renewed energy which they would do during the rest of the day now it's also odd to that the parents didn't stop working they continued to work while they were at home and then so having having to do that with the additional burden and stress of having to deal with their kids having to be teachers at the same time that they were working full-time was just completely overwhelming to a lot of parents let's not forget too that um a lot a lot of families were um, experiencing grief not just you know with their own families but with, with close friends with close with neighbors neighbors but even if they did not have a direct effect of COVID in terms of grieving or death, just the fact that this was also around them also made them go through the grieving process. Again, um, multiplying all of the stressors that they were feeling. Um, now I'm gonna ask this question and it um, maybe, I mean, it's, I'm not sure that we have to go into it quite as much depth on it, but a similar question as, as it relates uh, to the, our residential care system. And um, and what um, how we dealt with the stressors of that isolation and anxiety and um, uh, um, disruption um, for our youth in care and and, um, and 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 staff counselors that are working in 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 the residential system. Yeah. Uh very important question, which I'll turn to Deputy Commissioner Farber to, to talk about, but I, I guess I'll just start by saying that, you know, this, I think this kind of went in phases throughout the pandemic. There was sort of the initial phase where we didn't know very much, but things had changed dramatically and we had to respond and there was so much fear and so much anxiety. Um, and one of the things that we did um, was to make sure, uh, and I, I actually am I'm proud of how quickly um, we as an agency responded to this, to make sure that we got out as much information to providers, that we gave providers as much clarity as we could, which was often not as much clarity as we would have liked. Um, but we um, very quickly, you know, issued um, uh, modified policies to continue to do the work, but in a way that 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 took uh, new safety issues and new safety risks into account, um, and that we helped to make sure that providers had the resources to meet emergency needs for things like PPE, um, which as you know, all of us remember, it's a little hard now even, but uh, in, the, in the early days of the, of the epidemic was a huge problem, right? It was just difficult to get and then difficult to pay for. Um, and so we, um, we really took, took the approach that you know, we needed to get, get providers what they needed and then we would figure out how to help them pay for it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite proud of the work that all of our programs did um, to work with providers, to get them information, to get them guidance, and to get them the con 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 concrete things they needed to, to ensure safety. Um, but beyond that, let me turn to uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber to talk about how they dealt with those specific issues in the residential context. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I do want to take the opportunity just to, to reiterate that obviously in the, the nature of child welfare and foster, foster care, we never closed down um, and we just had to figure out um, how to pivot um, to continue supporting children and families and foster parents um, and our staff. Um, and so as the commissioner mentioned, we very quickly um, issued um, guidance and um, a range of emergency policies and protocols to um, support providers in terms of how to support young people during this you know, incredible time. In terms of your specific question, Chair, um, about children in residential, as you know, 
fortunately, we have a very um, small number and small proportion of children who are in residential programs. It's under 10% in New York City, and we do uh, very well uh, on that compared to other jurisdictions in the country because um, over 90%, the vast majority of children in foster care are placed in family placements, um, either with kin um, or in foster homes. Um, but for the number of children who are placed in residential care, um, I, I really need to acknowledge and thank the incredible staff and leadership um, at the residential programs who uh, continued to show up every day um, to ensure that young people were receiving the services and supports that they needed. And in fact, um, you know, took steps to obviously implement social distancing. And as the commissioner mentioned, um, we provided PPE. Um, and many providers um, implemented new ways of delivering programs, um, you know, obviously uh, delivering programs outside, um, you know, when appropriate, but also bringing in virtual online programming through a number of different resources um, that sort of ran the gamut of, you know, exercise and wellness and, you know, a, a range of supports. And then in addition, of course, working really um, diligently to ensure that all of those young people had devices and um, remained connected um, to school, um, you know, th throughout COVID. Um, and can you speak a little bit more maybe about partnerships with, um, with mental health resources? Um, for youth in care and what, what um, if there are any new resources that are available or other partnerships that you're able to, to um, move forward on? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, you know, across the system, not just in residential, um, you know, meeting the mental health needs of children in care is obviously, a, you know, a critical priority. Um, and that happens, you know, in a number of ways. Um, children in foster care are covered by Medicaid and receive therapy um, through that. Children who are in residential will typically have on-site um, therapists who are, you know, providing their care. And as the commissioner mentioned, um, and this is one of the, one of the lessons learned of COVID um, that, you know, will be positive for practice moving forward. Um, if anything, um, young people participating in therapy, it appears may have even increased um, because they really liked the telehealth, you know, young, young people like their phones. Um, and so uh, being able to do therapy um, through telehealth um, was first of all, uh, first of all, practical um, and enabled young people to continue receiving services um, during COVID, but also perhaps a preference. Now, as the, as the commissioner mentioned, um, we don't necessarily think that telehealth should entirely um, replace in-person, you know, mental health therapy and visits, but it certainly can be another tool in the toolkit um, to ensure that young people are receiving those services. And I think there's an opportunity too with kind of a, a, a larger um, normalization of, of, of therapy for young people. I think that's um, kind of out there in the zeitgeist and for, for people that are younger than I am that are kind of, you know, um, listening to, um, you know, in, in social media influencers that are, that, that are uh, you know, open about it or celebrities that are open about it. And I think that, that kind of maybe is helpful, you know, I think of like, Demi Lovato or Michael Phelps or you know uh, others that um, uh, 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 Naomi Osaka um, you know just recently you know just kind of getting the the um, the words the the word out there I think is is been is probably helpful actually among for young people. Absolutely. Um, can I ask uh, just uh, um, since I have you, Deputy Commissioner, um, how how um, if we could look a little bit more into how family visitations were, were impacted um, and how are we measuring that impact? Um, I mean, the, the, you know, along the same lines of the concerns that, of, um, you know, around child safety, um, the idea that parents whose children were in care, either, you know, in, in, in um, and um, were having regular visitation 
with them and being able to keep that relationship, um, the bonds of that relationship, you know, tending to the bonds of that relationship during that time, um, you know, I, I worry about um, uh, the impact that that COVID had on family visitation and 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 what impact that had on um, on those familiar bonds and and uh, and how we and and how we're measuring that and how we we address it or or um, try to strengthen that as in other ways. Um, thank you, Chair, for that question. Um, you know, reunification, safe and timely reunification, is our top priority at ACS, and we've testified before that family time. The research shows, um, you know, the frequency and quality of family time is the most important predictor of reunification. And so when the pandemic hit, um, as you alluded, um, we were very concerned um, about the impact um, on family time. Um, and as the commissioner mentioned, this was probably the area where we pivoted most quickly um, to figure out um, guidance and policy that would support all of the stakeholders in figuring out the best possible ways to have the greatest amount of family time, uh, also known as visiting, um, contact between children in foster care and their parents, weighing the public health risks and then weighing the trauma, um, you know, obviously, uh, and in the critical importance of children and parents being able to visit. And so as the commissioner mentioned, um, we immediately authorized the foster care agencies to buy uh, devices for everyone who needed them, whether it was children, parents, foster parents, staff, um, so that we could uh, facilitate virtual communication. Uh, and visits, um, and we provided some guidance around decision making for when visits could still be in person, um, you know, considering all of the various factors. And I think the commissioner also mentioned that, you know, we, we made very clear that there could be no blanket policy um, and that really this had to be a case by case um, determination based on all of the different factors. You know, perhaps the parent had a health concern that put them at risk, and maybe it made more sense for the parent. Um, you know, it also depends on the age of the child and, and, and so forth. And so we created guidance around that. We provided a lot of training and support around that guidance. And this was another um, learning chair from the, the pandemic was really to maximize the use of, you know, Zoom and WebEx for trainings. You know, we had trainings and webinars multiple um, on visiting um, that we implemented in partnership with RISE and other stakeholders that had, I think, you know, a couple of them had 600 staff, um, you know, from across the system because there was such interest in and commitment to ensuring um, that visiting, you know, was taking place. Now, I'm very pleased to share that, you know, at present, the vast majority of visits um, are taking place in person. And here again, another, you know, silver lining of the pandemic is that in addition to those in-person visits, there's a lot more supplementing going on using FaceTime and Skype and because that's now become sort of very regularized in the practice, um, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Um, did, you know, did, I, I, I might oh, just, add, just, just want to add to that, and again, because I really want to uh, acknowledge the, the great work that uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber and her team did. When we were making these decisions, you know, really in real time in the early months of the epidemic, of the pandemic, um, you know, we, we were paying attention to what was happening nationally, and we were seeing a lot of other foster care agencies uh, around New York State and around the country suspending in-person visits all, altogether. Uh, and many of them did that for quite a number of months into, in, through, through the summer of, of 2020. And we agonized over that because, you know, we, we obviously we value, you know, safety for children, safety for staff, but we just felt for all the reasons that I described in testimony and that Deputy Commissioner Farber just described, we just felt like it was so important to maintain in-person contact uh, that we couldn't do that. So we, the, you know, from the very first um, guidance we issued to foster care agencies, I think in April, we said, there cannot be a blanket policy. You cannot have a policy of no in-person visitation you have to do a case-by-case -case analysis of how important it is to that family and that child, and then make decisions accordingly. 
do we have any metrics on on the overall um I mean, obviously there would be a significant reduction in 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 person in person family visits, but uh, if there was an if there was a net reduction between prior pandemic in person family visitations and then some form of of visitation, um, you know, with months into the pandemic, whether you know combined in person uh, and or um, uh, you know televisit. Yeah, I don't have that exact data in front of me and we can, you know, circle back to you with that, but as a general matter, you know, certainly in the initial months and at the height of the pandemic, there were fewer in person visits um, and, you know, a lot of video visits and then as time passed, that balance has started to shift. Um, and as I mentioned, and I think it's it's been for quite a while now the vast majority of visits that are happening are in person plus now video visits, um, but we can get you additional detail on that, Chair. Um, and uh, um, with, with regard to um, uh, uh, family court proceedings and efforts around reunification, um, uh, first off, uh, can you explain a little bit about the coordination between ACS and OCFS for any kind of rule, um, you know, rule amendments or, you know, ways, ways in which you had to engage with our state agencies, the state agents, you know, the state to be able to um, uh, do programmatic things that that might have not otherwise been possible. And, and then our, um, how are we measuring the um, the impact on reunification timelines um, uh, from the pandemic. So so what you know are we able to extrapolate just how um, how far it set uh, families back on on average or um, other impacts that we might have um, you know trying identifying now at this point. Um, sh sure. Um... So, so a couple things, I think you asked a, a couple questions there. Um, I think the commissioner mentioned in his testimony that we were quite concerned um, when it became clear at the beginning of the pandemic um, that the family courts operations were extremely, extremely limited. And so we took um, aggressive action beginning really right away um, and continuing up until now to review thousands of cases with a reunification goal to determine um, outside of the you know, regular court process, if those cases could move to increased visiting, you know, overnight visiting, trial discharge, um, predisposition release, um, or, um, or final discharge. And, and in the cases where you know, we believed um, that the families were ready for that, um, our family court legal services worked with children's attorneys and parents' attorneys. And where there was agreement, we would seek stipulations. Um, and so through that effort, um, a lot of cases moved forward. And I think we, we staved off what, what could have been sort of much worse. Uh, you know, there, there has been a reduction that, you know, that data um, is in our flash report. There's been a, a reduction in all permanencies um, uh, across the system. And I think that the work that we did, um, you know, around this proactive review of cases um, sort of prevented a further reduction. And as the commissioner mentioned, this sort of aggressive, proactive work outside the court system is really another learning um, that we are um, continuing to utilize and accelerate moving forward, setting aside the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there should be no waiting for a court hearing. Um, the parties should be communicating and, you know, where possible, moving cases forward, you know, in, in advance of the court hearing. Um, and that's something that there's yeah. kind of a broad agreement with legal aid who represents the uh, the children in most cases um, and other legal services providers and um, and 
uh, OCS and or OCA, I'm sorry, OCA that um, that you know so it, that's is that there's a framework to kind of develop that further into more permanent into a more permanent framework. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I will I'll turn um, to my colleague Deputy Commissioner Spetz to to say a little bit more. But certainly the parents' attorneys and the children's attorneys have been extremely welcoming, uh, you know, of these efforts um, and to the conversations about figuring out whether we're all in agreement and whether it makes sense to submit a stipulation, um, yeah. you know, moving a case forward to to the judge um, and to the court and. Um, this relates a little bit to your question you asked about working with OCFS. We were working very closely with OCFS and and with the Family Court and the Office of Court Improvement um, to both collaborate with and advocate um, to the court to continue to accelerate its hearings of all sorts of matters. Um, so uh, to you know for 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 due process. Um, to ensure due process um, and to obviously to facilitate permanency um, and, and Deputy Commissioner Spetz may wish to, or the Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Hansel may wish to add to those comments. Well, let me, let me say uh, just some more about the court relationship and I'm sorry, the, uh, the state relationship and then I'll turn to uh, Deputy Commissioner Spetz to talk about the court system. Um, I have to I really credit um, our colleagues uh, at the state, uh, Commissioner Poole and the Office of, of Children and Family Services. Uh, they are our oversights. Um, everything we do uh, is done under their supervision. They are the, you know, the interpreters of state law and state regulation uh, about how uh, all of our program services are delivered. Um, and uh, they, I, th I think rightly, but I think you know, they quickly realized in the, in the early days of COVID that things were changing by the week, by the, the day, sometimes by the minute, um, and that there was gonna be a need for flexibility. Um, and so, you know, whereas normally, if we wanna change a, uh, a city policy, a local policy, um, we normally have to go through an approval process with the state to make sure it's in compliance with state policy. Um, they understood that here, you know, we, we're not gonna have the luxury of extended process in doing that, and basically, uh, you know, told us that you know we should uh, respond as we needed to. That they gave us the flexibility to do that. Obviously, we kept them um, fully apprised of what we were doing. We shared every policy with them as it was issued, um, but they were really, um, I think, helpful and forthcoming in giving us the flex and realizing that New York City is different from other parts of the state, right? So our reality was different from uh, the reality of upstate. They really gave us the flexibility. To, uh, to respond and to shift and change policy as quickly and as agilely as we needed to do. Um, and uh, really appreciative of that, because without that, it would have been, I think, much more problematic for us to respond to the local conditions that we were seeing. Um, let me turn to uh, Deputy Mr. Spots to talk about uh, the, the court situation and where we think it may be going in the future. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Chair Levin. I, I think um, Commissioner Hansel and Deputy Commissioner Farber covered a significant ground um, on this, but um, yeah, it should you know should be noted that in the beginning, when the core immediately shifted to a virtual platform, you know everybody had to pivot, uh, you know, to appear in court uh, virtually, um, and it, it's taken some time to um, accelerate uh, the appearances. And um, I can talk about when that we saw a significant you know uptick, really in January of 2020, but. From the very beginning, um, just from filing cases in court, there was, uh, it was important for um, ACS, my division, Family Court Legal Services, um, Division of Child Protection, Family Permanency Services, to work closely with the other um, legal organizations, the institutional providers for parents, the attorneys uh, for children, um, the uh, 18B panel who represent both uh, children and parents uh, to work collaboratively, collaboratively as possible to uh, move cases forward. So I think as, as Deputy Commissioner Farber uh, talked, I think we realized very early on, um, almost Im immediately that there was going to be significantly limited opportunities in court for um, hearings to take place on cases that had already been filed, let alone the cases that we were uh, you know, filing every day um, in court. And so, you know, as, as Deputy Commissioner Farber mentioned, we, we took an affirmative um, stance to uh, review cases. But in addition to that, in all of our borough offices, the leads uh, in the family court legal services offices and the leads for the institutional providers 
would get together to also identify cases to see where we could um, settle cases uh, that maybe were pending fact finding or settle, you know, settle cases at any procedural point in the case where we could come to an agreement. Um, and then it was really, you know, quite seamless to um, essentially file a stipulation with the court. Uh, the court did develop an electronic delivery system called EDS, uh, E-D-D-S, where we could submit stipulations that would be routed to the judge for uh, signature. And so we were able to have court, you know, oversight for those decisions that needed it. There are some decisions uh, where decisions are in the discretion of ACS. And that's where I think the affirmative case reviews were important, where we could see where we can move cases. We ourselves had the discretion to do so. Um, but I think we, you know, as, as time has gone on, uh, the two, two key things happened in, in January of 2020. Um, the court system uh, created a dedicated link uh, for every judge that they could use. And then also um, were able to adapt the um, uh, uh, recording system uh, to record proceedings. And you know, with, the, with the capability to record, there wasn't a need to have a, a live court reporter in every courtroom, um, which was very challenging to uh, secure. In the beginning, there were you know, maybe 20 or so uh, core parts uh, that were operational now in January of 20, I'm sorry, I should say January of 2021, uh, every, every judge had their own dedicated link with the capability to record so there could be an appropriate um, record for appellate review if, if needed. Um, and so we have since January of 2021 seen an uptick in the number of appearances that, that the family court legal services attorneys are, are doing and a significant uptick in, in court activity. I think with the recognition that, um, particularly for cases that that um, uh, whose outcome is is reunification, um, you know, any delays or you know significant delays in, in that reunification, um, you know, are accompanied with um, you know outcomes that we would wish to avoid. That we don't, you know, we we, we if 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 a family if a child is going to be reunified with their parent, we want that to happen as quickly as possible. So any Ministerial delays, um, you know, are 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 you know that's that's something we want to avoid. Um, um, so, in the, in, are these things even as we're getting back into, you know, a normal, uh, you know, back to some kind of um, uh, uh, semblance of pre-pandemic normal? Are are we? Is there a formal process that we're engaging with with um, with OCA or with the family court system and the other legal services providers to, 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 to formalize this relationship or these new, any new practices or any, you know, if uh, uh, this increased reliance on, 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 on stipulations or the affirmative case reviews, are we, um, how are we formalizing that, those processes? And, and is there a, is there a task force that's kind of set aside from, um, to, to kind of review these things and, and see how we could kind of further uh, uh, institutionalize these practices? Yeah, so we have a group um, within ACS that has been planning um, all of these reviews. So, you know, we, we do them rolling um, and uh, they have been ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. Um, and as I mentioned, the legal providers, you know, have been very responsive um, to outreach. Um, and to your point, um, you know, as we move this forward, um, you know, we will be speaking with the legal providers, um, you know, about additional structure that, you know, that may be helpful to them. Um, but we have really, you know, sort of fully implemented these and essentially are launching um, reviews of different categories of cases um, every few months. And maybe to add to that, what I would say, Chair, is that really there's sort of two work streams, I think, going on in parallel, because there are the actions that really don't require any court involvement other than signing a stipulation. And then there are the actions that do require more extensive court involvement that can happen uh, sort of independent of the court. So as Julie said, with regard to the process that can happen outside the courts, uh, where mm -hmm. all we need from the courts in the end, in some cases, don't even need the stipulation. Some, some cases are within ACS discretion to progress towards reunification. So there, 
you know, we have found this process to be so beneficial uh, that, you know, even, even when the courts reopen, and they have, they're far from fully reopened, which we should say, I mean, there's been progress, but they are far, far from normal operations. Um, but, you know, we don't want, when they are, we don't want to go back to being sort of dependent on court calendars uh, to move as aggressively as we can towards reunification. So we intend to continue this work and this process with the attorneys for, or for parents and children, the foster care agencies, which happens really outside of the courts. But sim simultaneously, as, as uh, Julie mentioned, there's a process with OCFS, with the Court Improvement Project and with OCA to look at how we can um, you know, re really um, encourage the courts, I'll, I'll, I'll say, um, to reopen um, as quickly as possible with regard to the matters that do require court involvement, court intervention, and ultimately court decision. Um, and um, you know, we, we wanna work as closely as we can with basically our state partners because the court system is, even though it's the New York City Family Court, it's really a mm -hmm. state run system. Um, so we have been and wanna continue to work with them uh, to encourage them to reopen as quickly as they possibly can um, for all of these matters, because there are some where court involvement is required and there's some where court involvement is necessary for due process protections. Um, so, uh, you know, the longer the court re courts remain restricted in terms of uh, the process of the kinds of matters you're going to hear, um, the more that's going to be an encumbrance on our ability to move uh, children towards reunification or other forms of permanency. Um, so I, I appreciate it. I have more questions, but I do want to turn it over to any of my colleagues if they have if they have questions. Um, so I'll ask my colleagues if you have any questions, please to raise your hand. Use the raise hand function. I don't know if any of my colleagues do have questions, in which case I'm happy to continue. Council members Rudenchik or Rosenthal. We've been joined by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. Um, those the only members that are with us at the moment. Um, if either, oh, Councilmember Rosenthal has questions. Thank you. I only have questions because you seem to want to take a break for a minute. So I'll ask questions <laughs> for a minute Thank while you can Thank you. do the amazing job of tending to your children like you do. I guess, you know, I'm not, this is not my committee and not my area of expertise, but in listening to your expertise, the thing that jim jumps out at me is do you think what and and perhaps we'll talk about this in terms of the 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 school children staying in the homeless shelters do you think they're getting the trauma informed uh care that they need um in terms of you know getting back we'll never get back but and is there anything more you you would recommend from you know what you're seeing that you can do and again the question is both for the students both in your shelter and the students who you know teachers are seeing back in the classroom um well thank you first of all i have to say uh councilman rosenthal this may not be your committee or your area of expertise but i know from our our past interactions it's an area you care a great deal about so <laughs> i appreciate that yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's a really important question. Um, you know, we, we work very closely with the Department of Homeless Services, um, especially um, with regard to families who are in the shelter system. And many of the families we were working with are in the shelter system. Um, and so we, again, back, back to the early months of the epidemic uh, last spring when things were completely remote, um, we worked very closely with DOE and the shelter uh, DHS and the shelter providers to make sure uh, that that uh, children had the technology they needed and and the you know uh, access they needed to participate. And there's no question there were challenges in the early months. Um, I don't think it was because of anybody's lack of trying. It was just it was a it was such a big change that happened so abruptly. Yeah. Um, and while you know it wasn't uh, first and foremost our responsibility, but we felt like when we were in interacting with families, interacting with children, we wanted to make sure we were doing whatever we could do uh, to, to assist. So um, when, for example, um, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher's uh, child protective specialists um, were working with families, not you know across the city, not just in the homeless shelter system, but certainly in the, the shelter system, when they encountered uh, children who were having difficulty with technology, either they didn't have the hardware 
or they didn't have the connectivity or they didn't know how to use it, um, part of what they would do in, in their involvement with those families was to address those issues, whether that was advocating with DOE to get the equipment there or actually helping kids and families learn how to use it. Um, so we, we tried to uh, assist as much as we could in those early months. I think things you know, got much better much very, very quickly. Um, but if, if you know, and obviously we'll, we're going to be back as the mayor has now announced to fully in-person schooling in the, in the fall. But as we've been talking about through the course of this hearing, we do think there are going to be a lot of situations where technology is still going to be the mode of interaction and should be, whether it's telehealth, telecounseling, telemental health visits. Um, there are going to be lots of situations where um, we, we do think that um, using these technologies can actually be really beneficial to kids. Um, and so I think it's gonna be incumbent on all of us to make sure that, um, that families and children in the homeless shelter system and really across the city have all the technology so that, no, that no families and no kids are disadvantaged by lack of access to services if we decide that some of those services should continue to be delivered virtually. I'm not sure that was really, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it, Commissioner. Um, I guess what I meant was, um, a little different than the technology aspect of it, but um, you teachers come to your agency to to report. You know, kid seems to. I think something's going on at home, right? Do you expect the number? You know, over the last year, obviously, my guess is. There were many fewer reports, I don't know. And do you expect that number to increase in September? Yeah, great question. We, we talked about that some earlier in the hearing, uh, but no, I'm happy, I'm happy to, to. So what we saw at the very beginning of the pandemic, yes, was a dramatic decrease, about 50% decline in March and April of 2020 in the number of reports that we received. But that changed very quickly. Um, and really even by the summer of 2020, um, that number had increased and was, was you know, beginning to normalize. And uh, in more recent months, uh, the number of reports we're receiving is still somewhat, somewhat less than it was before the pandemic, but much, much closer to normal levels. What are um, normal levels? Normal levels? We typically investigate, receive, and actually the reports don't come to us directly from the, for teachers, they go to the state, to the state uh, central mm -hmm. register, and then the state refers them to us for investigation if they're in New York City. We, in typical years, we receive about 55,000 reports from the state a year uh, that we are expected to act upon. Um, so what is that, about, about 1,000 a week, I guess, uh, on average. And do you, uh, do you track sorry. the nature of those concerns? Absolutely, absolutely. We track- like, um, What are your different buckets? Yeah, we track the, the, nat the nature of the allegation. Uh, is it-, is it um, uh, you, you know, broadly there's abuse and neglect, but even within those two categories, there are a number of subcategories uh, the, on abuse side, physical, sexual abuse, for example, neglect can be educational neglect. It can be um, uh, failure to seek medical care for a child. It can be excessive corporal punishment. So we track that and we track the type of reporter who, who, uh, who filed the allegations with the state. Makes sense. Have you seen changes? I'm sure the chair already asked you this. In, have you seen any pattern changes? The significant change we have not we have not seen significant changes in the type of allegation, which is actually reassuring because one of the questions that the chair started with was uh, a concern about whether with this dramatic reduction in the beginning, were we missing children who might be at home isolated and and uh, experiencing significant abuse? We actually didn't see anything in the in the patterns uh, of of cases that that um, would indicate that. We did see um, a significant change in terms of the reporters uh, because we were receiving yeah. fewer reports from schools, for example. We yeah. were receiving proportionally more reports from what we call non-mandated reporters, which are friends, family members, neighbors, community yeah. members, yeah. which we thought was reassuring because kids were spending more time at home. And it suggested that communities were taking responsibility for uh, making sure the kids were safe. So that was really the mm -hmm. one significant change we saw. That's so interesting how you just characterize the change. I asked the same question. We had a hearing last May. And Chair, I'm going to send it right back to you as soon as you come on. Now I'm just sort of, oh dear, can I just keep going down my wormhole? 
I, I was gonna just mention that last May, we had a hearing with the NYPD and asked about domestic violence incident reports and they brushed off the increased number of reports from neighbors. So in other words, what their take from it was, oh, the neighbors, they're just home now because everyone's home. So they're hearing the bickering they think it's domestic violence, they call us, we get there, nothing's really going on. So even though our run number is up, it's not a meaningful increase. And what I'm hearing just now from you is that the reporters are the neighbors and that became useful. It's just, a, do you, am I making, do you know what I'm saying? I do understand what you're saying. Obviously, I don't. I was not there for the hearing, so I don't know what uh, what the NYPD said. But from our perspective, um, we rely on reports from a whole range of sources, and uh, that includes both professionals, you know, mandated reporters in our in our parlance, um, but also non-professionals like community members, because um, they may be, you know, the first to become aware that something is going on in a family, going on at home, and uh, if we're going to get the right kind of services to that family, we first need to know. Uh, that something is happening and the family has a need. So um, uh, we actually appreciate it when, uh, when we receive reports and uh, enable us to follow up. And uh, we, we haven't really talked about this, didn't discuss this in the testimony, uh, but we have talked about previously, we're also shifting significantly the ways in which we respond to many of our reports. Um, if, if a report comes in, we do uh, an initial assessment, we don't identify imminent safety concerns for, for the child, but we do identify that the family needs some services we now are expanding our, what we consider our, our alternative track for handling that report. So it no longer is an investigation, it becomes a service engagement with that family. But again, the starting point for that is somebody uh, indicating to us that there is a family that is having an issue uh, and that is what enables us to go in, meet the, the, care, the caretakers or the parents uh, and assess whether there are services that would be helpful to them. And, and do you just, do you have a, uh, like a list of the DV survivor counseling programs and call one or the other? Like, what does it mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. If the issue is DV, um, and we have, we actually have seen an increase. I should, I should have said, we have seen uh, some of a portional, not a, not a, a quantitative increase, but a proportional increase um, in reports to the state central registry mm -hmm. that involve domestic violence. So yes, if we, if we uh, based on our initial investigation, determine that there really is uh, a domestic violence situation or an intimate partner violence situation that is creating a safety risk to a child, because that is the thing that we're concerned about, then yes, we have services we can engage both the, um, uh, the parent who may be also the victim of that violence um, and also the person causing harm. Um, so we have, we have services for either, and we actually have, uh, a new intervention that we have piloted uh, at ACS um, that we call Safe Way Forward that actually provides coordinate, different, separate, but coordinated services to the person causing harm and the person who may be the victim in situations where, and we know there are many of these, where there may be domestic violence in, in a family, but, the, but the, the family intends to stay together. The parents intend to stay together. Oh, yes, so the issue yes. is how can we help them do that safely? And yeah. we've launched a program actually a couple of years ago that we are piloting and now in the process of evaluating called Safe Way Forward that will offer for the first time, actually, as far as we know, anywhere in the country, coordinated services to both to try to ensure that, uh, that the parents can stay together safely if that's going to be their choice. That's extraordinary. I, I would, I'm going to turn it back to you, Chair, unless now I'm turning it back to you, Chair, but um, I would love to learn more about that. And this notion of simultaneously helping both the victim and the um, uh, acute The whatever. person causing harm is the terminology the that we person that coming, yes. Causing harm. I mean, it sounds a little bit restorative justice e that um, in the way that Mock J talks about their research and pilot programs with restorative justice in these situations. And I wonder if they're talking about the same program, the same programs, safe way forward. Um, and I'm very interested also in the, do, do you have a timing for when that 
report might be finished? Well, let me ask Desmond Commissioner Martin, because it really is her division that's been overseeing this. And so she probably knows the timing of the pilot and the evaluation better than I do. Great. She might be muted. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much um, for that question, um, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, we are definitely in the process at the very start of the evaluation mm -hmm. um, for a safe way forward. And uh, we would be uh, thrilled to, uh, you know, sit with you and share the results and, and where that um, evaluation is pointing us to. We're certainly excited about it. As the commissioner said, uh, we search um, for a very long time across the, the country and could not find um, any such service um, that worked, especially with the person causing harm, to offer an intervention that was more than just anger management, um, which is mm -hmm. oftentimes what, uh, you know, what yeah. the referral for services would be. Um, and so we anticipate um, perhaps sometime in late summer, um, early fall, um, having something substantive to share. Yeah, please put me on the list for that. And is that, are you working in conjunction with the Center for Court Innovation? Um, no, not, not at this moment and not on this, this particular project. Who's the contract agency? Uh, we have an independent consultant, um, and right now the, the the pilot has really been across two agencies and two borrows. We have um, uh, Staten Island, we have um, 60 families that can participate, and in the Bronx, we also have 60 families, so a total of 120 families at any point in time um, who are actually court you know, on court ordered supervision yeah. for these type of uh, interventions. And um, is, are you, is, uh, I mean, is NGBB uh, part of the evaluation group? Uh, not specifically a part of the evaluation group, but they've been at the table from day one as we were researching, designing, implementing uh, very important um, and strategic partners with us in this. And how much is spent a year on this project? Ooh, that's a very good question. I don't have that at my feet. We, we can get you that information. Yeah. Well, my obvious next question is going to be, if you think, if, if you feel positive, about the outcomes, is this something that we should be budgeting for for the city? Certainly, and that you know, as as we complete the evaluation, if it is positive, we will very much want to scale it up. As as Deputy Commissioner Martin said, it's currently only in two boroughs. We're piloted in two boroughs, um, but our hope is that it will show positive outcomes and results. And if it does, we certainly will want to scale it up and would then have a bunch of conversations with the council about that. Let's put it this way. If it were scaled right now to New York City, it would go from 120 families to how many? What's the number out there that could um, be appropriate for this program, you know, court order? Yeah. Family? That's a very interesting question. And we'd have to actually think about how to calculate that, but that's something else we could we could uh, take a look at and get back to you on. Yeah, it seems like two. Okay, great. So yeah, I would be interested in all of that. <laughs> so that's not part of the new need request you put into the mayor? Not yet, because we haven't completed the evaluation yet. Okay. Great, Chair, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much for the extra time, I appreciate it. Of course, thank you very much, Councilman Rosenthal. Um, uh, Commissioner, um, I, I wanted to ask about um, uh, primary prevention. You mentioned um, the, um, the, uh, the FEC um, expansion. Um, I, there's been, an, I, I've been impressed uh, I went and saw the Good Shepherd site in Brooklyn. Um, it's been a couple of years now. Um, and I hear from providers that uh, have are running the other programs as well, the other two programs. Um, how do, does, uh, 
does ACS see, or do you guys see, or the providers see um, a reluctance to engage with FECs because they are part of the ACS system and, um, and uh, families might be reluctant to engage with any, you know, proactively engage with any um, uh, organization that, that is, a, is related to ACS. I, I mean, I could, that's an understandable um, concern or reluctance, I imagine. Um, uh, is that something that you see on the ground or if, and if so, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Obviously, you know, as, as we now uh, have the go ahead to expand the program, it's something that we're thinking about a great deal. Um, when we launched the pilot with the three sites that we have, two in the Bronx and one in Brooklyn, as you know, um, we actually, um, because we wanted to make sure that wasn't a barrier, we did a number of things uh, to try to keep that from being a barrier. Obviously, the programs are run by, by uh, nonprofit providers. They are not uh, you know, ACS uh, branded programs. Um, each of the providers, as I talked about a little in the testimony, but we've talked about previously, um, even before they really launched the programs, they spent a lot of time in those communities, um, meeting with families, having parent cafes, really understanding what families wanted, and then putting together a service model or a program model that would address the needs of the families in that particular community. So it was not cookie cutter. There was no, no prescription uh, as to how, what the services would look like. Um, and then we also, we oversee the programs in a very different way than we do our mainstream prevention programs or others. Um, we don't collect the same kind of data. We don't monitor in the same way. Um, uh, so we did actually quite a bit in the way we structured the programs and our relationships with providers to provide that kind of arm's length protection so that uh, there would not be a, a potential stigma for some families. What we've seen on the ground, I would have to say both, actually both on the ground and through the evaluation that we did, um, uh, does not indicate that there was. We've obviously, each of the, each of the three has been uh, actually oversubscribed. They've been seeing many more families than we even initially uh, predicted. Um, and we talked about the modification. I talked about in my testimony, the modifications during COVID to address concrete needs and things like that. Um, and then we did an evaluation, which um, uh, I think we've shared with you, but we're certainly happy to share with you, which showed that families, um, you know, quite quite uh, overwhelmingly told us that they had had positive interactions with the FECs, that they had felt that their FEC involvement had, incre had improved their family functioning, had decreased social isolation, um, had improved parent-child nurturing, kind of all the, what we call the protective factors um, that we were hoping uh, the FECs would contribute to. So we don't have evidence of that. However, now that we're doing a, uh, obviously a very substantial um, scale of the program, um, we're, not, we're taking another look at that because we wanna make sure that the FECs are a welcoming environment for all families. And so if there are uh, issues that would make, uh, make that would you know, create a barrier to any category of families utilizing the FECs, we want to avoid that. So uh, as we now plan, and it's only been about a month since the mayor made the announcement, so we're still uh, you know, figuring out what the, the, the ramp up plan and schedule will be in the timeline. Um, but we are thinking about that and seeing if there are additional protections we can put in place um, to make sure that as we expand into other parts of the city, other neighborhoods, um, that we are reaching the broadest cross section of families and creating a welcoming environment. For the broadest cross section of families, so that's something we're uh, we're very much thinking about as part of the rollout. And are you engaging with parent advocate organizations um, to um, or individuals uh, impacted impacted uh, um, uh, individuals um, impacted families uh, on addressing these issues at the outset um, of the expansion? We well, we've gotten quite a bit of input already. <laughs> Um, and we're, you know, we're sort of thinking about what additional input we feel like we need to make sure we have a really a good picture of how, mm -hmm. uh, how the FECs are impacting families in different categories to make sure that we have enough information to, uh, to develop the, the new model to the extent that it will be different from the, from the existing model in the pilot. So uh, we've got a lot of information and we're thinking about what additional information we may need. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna run through some, a couple of questions and then, um and then uh, wrap it up because I know that we have a lot of uh, people that are here to testify. Um, uh, it's, report, it's been reported to committee staff um, that um, different, plat just as a technical issue, that different platforms are being used for child safety conferences and prevention services and visitations. So 
this is a WebEx, foster, you know, this is uh, foster care agencies are using, using Zoom, virtual visits were through WhatsApp, but that everyone seems to have migrated towards um, Microsoft Teams. Is there is, is that something you can you have familiarity yeah, with yeah. and you want to comment on? Yeah, I, I can say a little bit about that. This has been obviously an evolving issue throughout the pandemic. Um, so some of, some of that is, um, for, for better or worse, is outside of our control. Um, the Office of Court Administration uh, made the decision to migrate the court system entirely to Teams. Um, and so anything that involves the courts now has to be done on Teams. And that's a state decision that we have no control over. Right, over um, you. Uh, yes, it's, it's above our- the Invisible above hand. Our, <laughs> above my pay grade and a different level of government. Um, so that's, that's one. The other is with regard to the city, we were, we were told early on uh, that uh, do it, you know, which basically regulates city technology and is responsible for all cybersecurity issues and concerns in the city, um, had cybersecurity concerns about Zoom. And so we were told not to use Zoom for conducting agency business. So most of the agency, the work we do now is uh, done on either WebEx or Teams. However, because we know that families use different platforms, have different technologies on their smartphones and so on. We did not prescribe to our agencies um, what technology that they could use. So either foster care agencies or preventive agencies uh, and, and Deputy Commissioners Farber and Martin can, can probably elaborate on this. Um, we did not prescribe to them a particular technology they had to use. So they could be as responsive uh, to the you know, interests of families as possible. And in fact, even we, um, have because we want to make sure we, you know, especially where we need to communicate with families virtually, we want it to be responsive. Even we have been using, for example, WhatsApp and communicating with some families uh, in the work that we do. So we've tried to be flexible where we can, but there are some systems in which we basically have been told what the prescribed technologies are. Um, I apologize, I'm going to be jumping around here a little bit from topic to topic. Um, some issues around uh, Children's Center that I wanted to ask about. Um, um, so according to ACS data, between April of 2020 and March of 2021, there were um, and, at least 153 youth who were held at Children's Center for longer than 20 days waiting for placement. Um, do you have a breakdown of what percentage of those children were teenagers or children with physical disabilities? Um, and then a breakdown of um, uh, how many of those children were there for one month, three months, six months. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I don't have that. Uh, we can get that information to you if you can sort of sure. tell us the categories you're interested in. We'd be yeah. happy to get you that yeah. data. I, I will say, uh, oh, yeah, no, happy to happy to respond to that. Overall, um, well, first of all, as you, as you know very well, Chair, the, the Children's Center is a, uh, a short-term pre-placement facility for children who have been placed in foster care and we're still trying to find the most appropriate foster placement for them. Um, the, the population of the Children's Center actually decreased, has decreased dramatically during COVID. We actually have had a, a much slower census of the Children's Center during COVID than we had previously. Um, and length of stay overall has not increased. Um, it's, still, it's still the case that uh, about half of kids uh, at the Children's Center leave within three days and about 80% leave within a week. So the vast majority of children are still there for a very short period of time. And then either, either reunified with their families, which is always the preference if that's safe to do, um, or uh, we've identified another foster placement for them. But there are some, a smaller set of kids that have more complex needs for which we have to really make sure that we're providing a, a foster placement that has the right kind of therapeutic services for them, which sometimes does take longer. Um, as I said, if you can and tell us the categories you're interested in, we can certainly provide you with more detailed data. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we've been made aware that uh, children that are um, at the Children's Center are, are not permitted to keep their cell phones. Um, is that a policy that, um, or what's led to that policy and what's, is there, um, is ACS looking at changing that policy? I imagine for, especially for, for youth that are older, you know, that's, that's um, um, something that, you know, most normal, uh, you know, uh, teens and preteens, you know, rely on their cell phones. Yes, understandable. Um, I am going to have to turn to my colleagues on that one. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Mar uh, Farber, I think you can speak to that.
Ah, there we go. Now I'm unmuted. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, so this is an issue of great concern to us um, because like, like you said, Chair, um, you know, everybody's really attached to their phones and it's really important and it's an important way, you know, that all of us um, stay connected. Um, the challenge, of course, is also balancing confidentiality and privacy and ensuring that, um, you know, videos aren't being taken, um, you know, by kids of other yeah. kids and so forth. And so it's a tough, it's a tough, complicated issue. Um, and so one of the ways um, that we have tackled that is by establishing what we call cell phone cafes. And so there are you know, times um, when the young people can get their cell phones and you know, they're in a supervised place and be able to use their phones. Um, you know, in a, you know, in a supervised setting. And so that's, that's really how we've been addressing that issue in terms of just trying to, to balance um, not just privacy and confidentiality, but also safety, um, you know, in terms of how, um, you know, young people may, you know, may be using, um, you know, cell phones and images and posting and so forth. Um, if that were to be permitted, um, you know, sort of everywhere um, in the building. That's understandable that there's, um, you have to be able to balance that, uh, you know, certainly to the extent possible, or maybe <clears throat> is it available on request or like in this, in the cell phone cafes or do the, is it only for like, you know, um, certain allotted times? So there are the cell phone cafes and then young people can also sort of outside of the, you know, scheduled cell phone cafes have access to their phones. And they want to speak with speak with parents or you know siblings or friends or so forth. So yes, absolutely, um, or their attorney uh, and so right. forth. Yeah. Um, okay, it's certainly something that um, we'll have to keep keep looking at and, um, because again, yeah, every I'm, I'm, again, I'm not I'm, I, my kids are little, but I'm assuming that by the time they get to eleven or twelve, they're going to probably be very um, interested in their phones. Yeah, it's really important. No, no question. Really important. Um, and then I just one follow uh, one follow up around children's centers where uh, I imagine you don't have it right now, but um, if we could um, know the percentage, Commissioner Hansel mentioned that the, actually the length of stay has decreased uh, the average length of stay um, um, for, for youth in, at the children's center. If, if that's if that's the case, if we could get some data just around the impact of length of COVID on length of stay for different age categories and uh, positive or negative. Yeah. Because yeah. That, yeah. Actually, what I to be just to be clear, what I said was uh, the overall census has decreased during COVID. Okay. Length of stay has not increased. It is basically. It has made, increased. I mean, it has oh, not, you mean it's not. Pretty much the okay. same. But we can certainly get you that data, and we can we can um, uh, stratify it uh, by ages. Great. Sure. That'd be great. Um, and then uh, moving over to foster care. Um, <clears throat> Are there children at the Children's Center right now who are awaiting fo uh, therapeutic foster homes? And uh, what's been the impact of COVID on therapeutic foster homes? Are there any vacancies or, or are, is there a, has there been a decline in, um, in new therapeutic foster homes coming online? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. And I have to take this opportunity to just really thank the incredible um, you know, New Yorkers um, who are foster parents um, and, and who became foster parents even during the pandemic. Um, foster parent recruitment and training continued. We pivoted to make the training virtual um, and to try and support um, New Yorkers who wanted to become foster parents. We also had foster parents um, you know, who were um, accepting placements, uh, you know, accepting children, including some children um, who were COVID positive, which is really um, incredible. Um, and so as the commissioner mentioned, um, we, we fortunately um, had a, you know, reduced number of kids at the Children's Center and we did not have increased um, length of stay there. Um, we have, um, some kids there right now. I mean, obviously, every day it changes because every day, um, you know, new new kids are leaving. Kids are leaving, um, and children are are coming. Um, but I think the last count, as of um, a day or so ago, we had about a dozen children who were awaiting therapeutic foster homes. I think you asked about um, 
therapeutic foster home recruitment. So we do have aggressive efforts happening um, around recruitment of all kinds of um, foster homes, regular therapeutic and, um, and special medical foster homes. Um, there are foster homes that have vacancies. I think that was your question, whether there, whether there are vacancies. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. critical, um, our critical focus is making sure to have a placement match, you know, that works, that is best um, suited to meet a child's needs. And so of course that relates to geography, you know, um, you know, so the child can, you know, maybe stay in their own neighborhood, stay in their school, stay close to their parent if their goal is reunification. Um, and, you know, it, it relates to, um, you know, sort of the, um, you know, capacities and, and particular, um, you know, areas that, you know, foster parents can support young people in. And so that's our, that's our most important focus. And we take very seriously, um, you know, the decisions around placing children. And when it comes to teens, um, obviously, um, as, as you alluded, council member, teens, um, you know, have their own um, opinions, obviously, um, which need to be taken into account. Um, and so sometimes you have children for whom placements have been found, um, but the children have not yet, the teenagers have not yet agreed. Um, and so they, they may be choosing um, to want to stay at the children's center. And so work needs to be done, um, you know, with those children and the adults who are close to them, um, you know, to, to help them make a move um, to a placement that will support their needs. Um, and has... Um... Has, have we seen a measurable impact in terms of our recruitment, particularly recruitment for older kids, um, parent foster homes for older kids um, as a result of the pandemic? Have we, have we seen a significant impact one way or another? Yeah, so prior to the pandemic, as you know, because we've proudly testified about this, um, we increased recruitment by 50% um, from FY17 to FY19. Um, and then yes, the pandemic has had um, some impact um, in terms, as, as, as you wouldn't expect, um, in terms of the numbers of new homes recruited and you know, some parents who were in the process of becoming certified you know, slowed or, or put a pause on. Um, and so fortunately now though, um, we are working and seeing progress towards building back um, towards, you know, pre-pandemic levels. Um, and I also wanna mention that um, as, as the commissioner mentioned, you know, we, we issued the foster care RFP last week. Um, and that is obviously a huge opportunity um, that we are leveraging to scale um, the home away from home and other strategies that you know we've been implementing over the last couple of years, um, including this um, through the task force, um, uh, Chair Levin. Um, so you should be proud of that as well, um, but through the RFP. Um, and so through the RFP, we will be um, you know, accelerating our work uh, to significantly expand clinical services and supports for kids and specialized training for foster parents um, under the new contracts, all foster parents will uh, be trained as therapeutic foster parents. Um, and we are significantly increasing the numbers of special medical foster homes as well. Is this the uh, deputy commissioner? Is this the is this the the first RFP under your leadership as deputy commissioner? It is certainly, um, and under Commissioner Hansel's too, the entire foster care system has not been RFP'd uh, at you know for the uh, the entire system um, for a little bit over a decade. Um, wow! So we're you Just know think about the advancements that have have gone in terms of programmatically over the last decade. It's pretty remarkable. Yes, um, and so we're, we've taken this opportunity to, you know, essentially scale all of the um, things that have been piloted and implemented um, over these last five years um, across the system, um, including, um, I will mention, um, uh, scaling an approach called Parents Supporting Parents, um, where 
every um, parent who's working towards reunification will have a parent with lived experience, a parent advocate with lived experience at their foster care agency assigned to them. We, we piloted that this past year with foundation funds and started with nine advocates. And that's going to grow from nine to uh, about 150 advocates across the system through the RFP. That's great. Um, oh, uh, uh, two other two other questions I had. With, um, first is um, uh, Commissioner Hansel mentioned in his testimony that um, during the during the pandemic, the kinship placement was over 50 percent. Um, obviously, that's that's um, that's great. Um, and are we, I, I, I imagine the answer is yes, but are we hoping that that, that, that trend continue after COVID? And, um, that's, that's higher, I think, than, than the percentage that we were anticipating in the, uh, the, the as the task force recommendation, right? Um, Commissioner, do you want to, do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me start then, but this yeah. really is great. And this, this is really uh, I need to acknowledge Deputy Commissioner Fletcher and his team. Um, so yes, um, just to be right. clear about the numbers, um, during the pandemic, over 50% of initial placements in right. uh, foster care were with kinship homes. And so now across the entire uh, foster care system now, it's about 42%. But this really speaks to uh, the remarkable work that our child protective specialists have done um, so that when they're working with a family and um, uh, and uh, uh, placement in foster care seems like a possibility, they begin at very early stages to talk with uh, the family, with the parents, with the child about who potential kinship resources might be. Um, and really the great work that they have done is really what has gotten us to over 50%. And yes, absolutely, this is a direction we hope will continue. We would love to see this number uh, continue to increase as, as much as we possibly can. And it is circling back to your previous question, uh, Chair Levin, it's part of the reason why, even though we've had something of a slowdown in the new foster home recruitment pipeline during COVID, we actually haven't had a shortage of foster homes. And that is partly because we've had more children in kinship placements, which of course are completely outside of the normal foster home recruitment process. Um, so that's really essentially increased our pool um, together with the fact that of course we've had fewer children uh, entering foster care during the pandemic. So. Uh, we really haven't seen any kind of a shortage of foster homes. Because the objective in the task force was, I believe it was 40, 43% or something like I that? I think 46% may have been our 46. target. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber will probably remember better than I do. I think it was 46%. Is I that think right? it was 46% um, for the, you know, for the overall system. Um, as, the, mm -hmm. as the commissioner mentioned, um, the, the statistic that we're referring to now, which is really exciting, is the um, that place. were over 50% of kids when they're entering um, through uh, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher and his team's incredible work. It's more than 50% of children who are entering um, are going straight into a kinship placement. And this is an effort that cuts across different um, different uh, um, units in, in at ACS because it's both uh, under 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 Deputy Commissioner Fletcher and and uh, you Deputy. Barbara, right? If there's, it's a coordinated effort. That's right. Um, so, you know, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher's team works to try and find that first placement as a kinship placement. So that child spends no night um, with anyone other than kin. And then when that's not possible, our foster care agencies work to identify kin and move children to kin um, when that is appropriate. And so we are going um, to continue to push this um, really a, as far as we possibly can. And again, this is another area um, where the strategies you know, piloted under the foster care task force and, and our foster care blueprint um, are fully scaled um, in the RFP that we just issued. And then my last question is uh, for the, the FECs, um, uh, I know that they were initially developed under um, the supervision of, of uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Lorelei Vargas. And I, I, where is that, where do they live now? Yeah, they, uh, well, so, Actually, this goes back to your previous question in a sense about, about uh, really make, making sure that they are being operated in a way that does not create um, a perceptual barrier for any families to be there. 
Um, one of the first things that I did actually when I became a commissioner, we talked about this a number of times, I think, is I created a new division within ACS called the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing for exactly that reason. I felt that we needed to have a division that was separate from our child welfare divisions that was responsible for services that were um, supportive to families, that were providing information and resources to families, completely independent of any kind of involvement in the child welfare system. So we created a new division, which uh, then Deputy Commissioner Vargas um, headed. Um, it is currently headed by uh, Acting Commissioner uh, Karen Resnick, uh, but still exists. The, fam the FECs remain there, as well as our, um, all of our uh, information educational work for parents is there, our community partnership program. So basically everything, and our child care program too, which we actually think of as a you know, supportive service for families. So they are all um, uh, reside within our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing. Um, so I just want to acknowledge then uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Resnick, and 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 I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, former Deputy Commissioner Vargas, because um, I know that she, she put a lot of work into um, uh, creating this program from the ground up. Absolutely, well deserved. Um, okay, that those are all the questions that I have, and I know we have a lot of uh, members of the public that wish to testify. So I, I appreciate everybody's patience and us getting through these questions, and um, look forward to hearing from. Um, to members of the public and um, and and uh, and lastly, I just I I, I appreciate um, um, your uh, Commissioner Hansel and you and your team's willingness to to, to talk through these issues and um, and really look forward to um, you and your team um, continuing to delve into these questions of what um, we've been able to learn through the pandemic and how. Um, and how it's been, um, how we've been willing to um, uh, challenge our assumptions. Um, I think, um, I guess I would, I'll ask one last question and that's, you know, are, is it, are the lessons learned particularly around the question of, you know, as we initially saw those, the calls the SER coming down, but not, not a, a, an increase in critical indicators, so emergency room visits or anything of, of that sort. Um, I mean, is it, is it, is it, does this, should this lead us to challenge the assumptions that we have had for a few generations now um, that, especially for, for mandated reporters, that the first call, um, if there's any suspicion, is to the SDR? Um, is there an over reliance? on calling the SCR that we have kind of in the world of mandated reporters. This goes back to, um, I met with, with uh, your, CP, your CPS um, a couple of years ago in Brooklyn and, um, and there was this kind of overall question of they said, we're, you know, I remember hearing from, from CPS that said, we understand our implicit bias. We've been working towards understanding our implicit bias but may, our mandated reporters working, is that universe of people in our city working on, on understanding their implicit bias? Um, and so are these, is, this, is this challenging our, our, our assumption on reliance on the SCR actually, which is this big kind of overarching question? It's a great question. It could, this could probably be the sort of a whole another hearing. I don't wanna go off too far, but I, I'm, I'm glad you asked it because I think the answer is yes in, in several respects. One is um, where you were going, uh, Chair Levin, which is, um, do we need to think about the mandated reporter system somewhat differently? I think um, we have been trying, you know, I think in the past, I think sometimes there was a sense that, um, uh, you know, mandated reporters were, were sort of encouraged to be overly inclusive in their reporting. Um, we've really tried to change that in a number of ways, um, partly for one, for one reason, because we know that there is um, dramatic racial disproportionality in the reports that are received from mandated reporters. That is a fact. Um, so we had, for example, and based on uh, you know, the discussions uh, you know, uh, and the input from CPS, which you heard directly, we had been mandating for, uh, or we had been advocating for implicit bias training for mandated reporters. And I'm very happy to say that the state budget that was just passed a couple of months ago now is going to require that. So mandated reporters will be receiving implicit bias training. I think that's a step forward. Uh, we've also, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, have been working with the largest categories of mandated reporters, which are really the schools and the healthcare system, 
to um, really to be more, I guess you could say more sort of self-critical about uh, what is and is not reported. So with the schools, for example, as I mentioned during remote learning, um, we worked with the schools on guidance to just differentiate what is truly a child safety issue from what is another kind of concern that may need to be addressed, but should not be reported to the SCR and should not become a child welfare issue. Similarly, we've done that work with the, uh, the hospital system around reporting uh, in the maternity uh, context. So um, we do think there are opportunities to um, really focus on the role of mandated reporters when it is appropriate. Clearly they have a very important role in identifying uh, potential child maltreatment, but making sure that they are uh, reporting the right kinds of, of, of things and not others. Um, and we also believe, and actually have been working with uh, the state and the Office of Children and Family Services, um, that there could be um, a little more um, discernment at the SCR level about what reports are accepted and referred to us for investigation. Uh, and particularly around uh, reports, which are of great concern to us because they really undermine you know, the integrity of the system, reports that are malicious or fraudulent um, or are, uh, you know, are made not for uh, really appropriate reasons. Um, and um, you know, those, we think there are many of those reports that are, there are in fact, many of those reports made to the SCR um, that currently are referred to us and we are required to investigate even when we uh, feel on their face that it is clear that they are not uh, really being made for appropriate reasons. Uh, I believe it is a misdemeanor <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to fraudulently call the SCR. It is indeed, it is indeed. And we make referrals to the district attorney's offices in cases where we uh, get them and, and we feel uh, fairly sure from what we see that, that that's the case. We have sometimes have, you know, family situations in which we receive dozens or even hundreds of reports. Um, mm -hmm. So we do make- I know somebody that's a, that's a public figure um, who um, had uh, uh, reports come in from out of state, numerous reports coming from out of state that, that there was you know, uh, abuse and neglect uh, calls. And it was um, very concerning because it was like on a political level somebody was getting. Um, Retribution, but it happens on an interpersonal yeah, level. It does happen. It does happen. And so we think that uh, there could be more that the, the state could do at the <coughs> SCR level uh, to vet calls and, and make decisions or to give us more discretion, even when a mm -hmm. case is accepted and referred to us, to discretion not to initiate an investigation if we feel on the face of it there's uh, you know, real evidence to think it was um, fraudulent or malicious. So that's a real issue. That's a real issue that exists. It is a real issue. It is a real issue. Um, and then the third is, and this, you know, partly because uh, the SCR does tend to accept most reports and refer them to us. Um, you know, we have, as we've talked about previously, we are dramatically expanding our, our CARES program, our, our alternative uh, track for dealing with reports that we receive where our initial assessment indicates there are not imminent safety risks for a child, but there may be service needs for the family to try to engage the family from a service perspective rather than an investigative perspective. Um, and part of the reason we do that is because there are a significant number of reports. Uh, and you know, we, we do routinely end up um, not indicating about two thirds of the reports we investigate. Um, so I, I do think uh, that we, all of us uh, that are part of the system uh, need to, um, and partly this is based on the experience of COVID, but I think that partly this was something that was, was evident to us even before COVID, need to make sure that we are using the tools appropriately in all situations and are not being overly expansive or overly inclusive about uh, bringing families into the child welfare system or, or involvement of the system where it is not necessary to um, achieve any kind of a safety goal. All right, thank you, Commissioner. I'll, I'll, I'll let you all go. We've been you know, in for two and a half hours here, so I, I do appreciate everybody's patience here. Um, and I wanna thank you and your team um, for your testimony and for your candid conversation. And Thank look forward you to much. continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn it over to um, to committee council. Thank you, Chair Levin. We have concluded ACS's testimony and are now going to turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and you may begin your testimony once the sergeant at arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few seconds of a delay when you're unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. 
The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Neela Natarajan, Sua Kim, Zainab Akbar, and Jennifer Feinberg. And we are going to begin with Neela Natarajan. Clock is ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nila Natarajan and I'm a supervising attorney and policy counsel at Brooklyn Defender Services in our family defense practice. Thank you, Chair Levin and the General Welfare Committee for the opportunity to testify today. In our written testimony, we offer a number of key recommendations, but in my limited time, I'd like to address how the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated families' inability to resolve their family court cases with family reunification and to access services. For context, during the pandemic in New York City, the reunification rate of separated families has gone down over 20% from the previous year. ACS recommends a quote unquote service plan for nearly every family and parent facing allegations of abuse and neglect in family court. This plan is often lengthy, rote, and attenuated from the resources a family needs or the supports they're asking for. Nevertheless, ACS and the court consider this service plan vital to resolve the alleged safety concerns within a family dynamic. Because of the strict 15 month timeframe dictated by the Federal Adoption and Safe Families Act or ASFA, it is absolutely vital for parents fighting to reunify with their children in the system to enroll, engage and complete these services quickly. Doing so can make the difference between reunification and the legal and permanent severance of the parent-child relationship. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, access to these crucial in-person services was abruptly discontinued. The unexpected and unprecedented disruption in services delayed reunification and had an immeasurable impact, particularly for families who are nearing that 50 month deadline. I'd like to share a story of a parent my office worked with and how the pandemic impacted her ability to reunify with her children. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, ACS had already filed a termination of parental rights or TPR petition against Ms. H. At that time, Ms. H had already completed a substance use treatment program, domestic violence counseling, parenting skills for children with special needs, and was engaged in therapy and using a visitation coach. Her I'm only... you, you can keep going. Her only remaining service was to continue to engage with this visitation coach and to join her children's counseling sessions. The pandemic completely disrupted her children's mental health services, the family's visitation schedule, and access to a vision tasting coach. After the start of the pandemic, Ms. H never saw her children in person again before ultimately surrendering her parental rights. The gap in these crucial support services meant that her children weren't receiving therapy they needed and that she wasn't able to participate with them to better understand their needs and support them. We strongly recommend that in, in accordance with guidance issued both by OCFS and the Federal Department of Health and Human Resources Children's Bureau that ACS consider the COVID-19 pandemic a quote unquote compelling reason under social services law to not request a permanency goal change from reunification to adoption, to decline to file a TPR petition, and to provide a family more than those 15 months to reunify. This is just a small recognition of the tremendous impact of the last year on already marginalized families. Can I ask that just quickly, um... You said that that client was on a reunification goal and that was switched over to an adoption uh, goal because of the pandemic and she ended up uh, relinquishing her parental rights? It's my understanding that the goal had changed prior to the pandemic. However, she was still working towards that goal herself. Um, mm -hmm. and she was already well on her way towards reunification. But there was a complex web of scheduling of the services for each children, the visits for each child um, that completely fell apart when, uh, as the commissioner attested. So any chance that any chance that she had um, was correct. That's tragic. I'm sorry that that happened. Uh, I appreciate it very much. And and um, I mean, it, if the, certainly if there are cases um, where um, these are. Uh, is ongoing cases where issues like that exist, you know, uh, more than happy in my limited um, ability uh, to to assist in any way. Thank you, Chair. I, I will say, you know, the commissioner testified about uh, making efforts to work towards quick reunification outside of the court system, um, and we appreciate those efforts. Um, we think that that should always be ACS's goal, 
to work towards reunification quickly if, if that's possible. Um, and, and we look forward to continuing to work with ACS to try to make reunification happen with or without uh, the delays in the court that we're seeing now. Um, can I ask in your experience, um, is that also the case, not just for, for, for kind of quick reunifications in, a, in, in the early stages of a, of a foster placement, but also in, in, in you know, ongoing, if, if somebody continues to have, if somebody has a, a reunification goal um, uh, uh, 12 or 15 months in, is that is your experience that they are that they are still working on uh, on those types of new frameworks with those cases as well, not just in the early stages? I would say that it becomes more and more difficult um, to get the type of collaboration and communication I think that families really need to make reunification happen. Right. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this dynamic because it's not. It's oh, it's not always that ACS has exclusive authority because it's also children's lawyer, it's also OCA, um, and so things get very complicated. If there's an additional lawyer involved, if foster parents have a lawyer, things get very complicated um, the longer a case goes on. And, and so, um, absolutely. Yeah. Also, you know, we work very, very closely with our social workers who also work directly with foster care agencies and ACS case planners. And sometimes it's just about knowing what a family needs to do um, to get. Yeah. Sometimes that in and of itself isn't clear. It's not just about uh, reunification or not, but what's the path forward? Right. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how, how that relationship and, and any things that were, any progress that was made during COVID on, in terms of that kind of process, how that could be further kind of codified and, um, and that process be, um, yeah, be, be more ingrained into the, into the overall framework. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Neela. We are now going to move on to Sua Kim. My name. Oh, is ready. My name is Sua Kim, and I am a social worker in the Bronx Defenders Family Defense Practice. Throughout the pandemic, I have witnessed the profound ways that families in the family regulation system have suffered due to the lack of access to technology like cell phones, tablets, laptops, stable Wi-Fi, and data plans. I have seen countless parents unable to see or visit their children virtually because they did not have working technology. I have seen parents' continued engagement in services and ACS programs curtailed and suspended because they didn't have access to a cell phone or a tablet. I have also seen parents be cut off from participating in their own defense when they were unable to call into court and case planning meetings like child safety conferences and family team conferences because, again, they didn't have enough money for the technology. And what's worse, rather than work with parents and advocates to think creatively, to problem solve and to mitigate these issues, ACS time and again took advantage of the pandemic. While it is true that early in the pandemic, ACS put out guidance encouraging caseworkers and foster care agency staff to provide phones to parents to facilitate visitation and service engagement, as an advocate, I saw that this guidance was regularly ignored. ACS was quick to throw up their hands and give up. When technology was the barrier to parent-child visitation, there was little effort from ACS to help parents solve the problem. So often the answer was, what are we supposed to do? It's COVID. We don't know, it's COVID. The parent has to figure it out, it's COVID. Advocates and the parents that we worked with faced opposition from ACS at every turn. From ACS caseworkers balking at parents' requests for daily video calls with their children to flat out refusing to provide the technology. At the end of the day, COVID has laid bare and brought into sharp relief what has always been true. ACS is not a system of support. It will always flow towards what is easiest, even when that's to the detriment of families. COVID has also magnified the deep resilience in Black, Latinx, and low-income communities. Despite the racist, classist, ableist forces, including but not limited to ACS, our clients figured out ways to maintain their bond with their children. What this shows us is that New York City should not invest in ACS, but rather in its communities, because communities know best how to take care of themselves. They simply need the financial support and material resources to do so. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Sua. I'm now going to call on Zainab Akbar and Zainab will be followed by Jennifer Feinberg. Over to Zainab. Ak is ready. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Zainab Akbar and I'm the managing attorney of the Family Defense Practice at Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. Thank you for this opportunity to testify about the child welfare system um, during COVID-19. Um, I joined the testimony of my colleagues from the Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defender Services, and the Center for Family Representation. And I'd like to point out that although the 30 odd uh, community members on uh, this hearing have waited two and a half, more than two and a half hours to be heard, not a single member of ACS's staff um, has stayed on to hear from the community. And I think that speaks volumes and it speaks more than the two and a half hours of testimony they gave about their commitment to the communities they claim to serve. When this pandemic began last year, no one knew what long and short-term impacts New York City would witness. With budgets stripped, stripped and resources made fallow overnight, the existing system of so-called child welfare, or what we call the system of family policing, like so many other systems, was forced to shift priorities. In conducting this triage, the system's values have been laid bare. Our experience is that ACS does not approach our clients with compassion, empathy, openness, and support. ACS approaches our clients with mistrust, disrespect, suspicion, and punishment. And that did not change during the pandemic, despite ACS's testimony today. For months at the beginning of the pandemic, parents were on the path to reunification, suddenly had no ability to see their children, no ability to comply with service plans, and no ability to petition the court to modify existing orders to bring their families together in those very frightening early days. With no way to advance their cases, families remained under so-called supervision of ACS, continually surveilled by this government agency, often without any legitimate basis to do so. Despite the breathless prognostications in major media outlets across the country last year, there are no indicators that there has been any increase in child abuse during the pandemic, even according to the commissioner's testimony today. Thankfully for New York City's families, um, what has changed is that the number of petitions filed by ACS is in fact reduced greatly. Unfortunately, however, the pace at which cases resolve has slowed to that of a snail. Because of greatly reduced access to court, NDS has gone to great lengths to resolve cases with little uh, court involvement. Yeah, uh, and we have all had some success identifying individual cases and negotiating settlement directly with leadership of ACS. But despite the commissioner's testimony, we have not experienced any comprehensive commitment by ACS to adjust its approach to ensure that families are unified and cases are resolved as quickly as possible. ACS fails to provide basic discovery for months into a case, sometimes up to a year. ACS and agency caseworkers fail to appear in court or to provide accurate or thorough reports to the court regarding a family status. Preventive agencies threaten to call in new cases against families for discontinuing services after the legal case is concluded and where there are no safety concerns. ACS lawyers fail to communicate with their clients regarding settlements of cases. The list goes on and on. I could speak forever about those kind of shortcomings. Um, and throughout the pandemic, judges have also prioritized quick completion of hearings to terminate parental rights um, and the issuance of permanency hearing orders, even without conducting permanency hearings while refusing to timely hold statutorily required emergency hearings to reunify families. Given the disproportionate representation of non-white families and family policing proceedings, there's only one way to interpret these actions. As prioritizing-, uh, as prioritizing Go ahead and finish. Thank you. As prioritizing the separation and destruction of black families and families of color, over their preservation and reunification. This phenomenon is not new, but the impact of the pandemic has made its, its existence much more clear. New York City's courts are rife with racism. City Council sh should support efforts to create a robust and comprehensive review of how racism functions within New York City's family courts and work with community members who are impacted by the family policing system to develop a system for accountability. ACS is a giant government bureaucracy and the city council should support any effort to divert funding away from ACS and to community organizations with a demonstrated track record of providing support and keeping families together. Trusted community organizations that are not beholden to ACS. It cannot be overstated. There is an inherent conflict for the government agency that is tasked with prosecuting parents and separating families to also be responsible for supporting families. New York City's families do not need more policing and surveillance by ACS, they need support. The same easily resolvable issues, banal incompetence and indifference to human suffering that existed in the family policing system before the pandemic now can delay reunification and extend surveillance for low income black and brown families we serve. And it's doing so in a time where the family connections and the sacredness of the home space has become paramount for most people. We ask that city council move beyond ACS's self-congratulatory testimony today and work with impacted communities to create systems of accountability throughout the family policing system. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Ackborn. Um, just, just for the record, I just want to point out that uh, uh, there is representatives from, from ACS. There's a representative from ACS on, on, still on the call right now, Rachel Jones. I appreciate it very much your testimony. Thank you, Thank you Zainab, for your testimony. I'm now going to call on Jennifer Feinberg for testimony, and Jennifer is going to be followed by the following. Halima Washington, Martin Guggenheim, Abigail Lyons, and Anna Blondel. Again, I'm gonna turn it now over to Jennifer Feinberg. Clock is ready. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Feinberg and I'm a litigation supervisor at the Center for Family Representation. Thank you, Chairman Levin, um, for giving us the opportunity to testify today. CFR is the countywide assigned family defense provider representing the majority of parents charged in ACS by ACS and Family Court in both Queens and Manhattan. We represent approximately 2,400 parents a year. The importance of frequent in-person parenting time where a child, well, while a child is separated from their parent cannot be overstated. This contact reduces the trauma of removal and expedites reunification. With the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, family time for the majority of children who had agency supervised visitation came to a complete halt. ACS and agencies unilaterally restricted in-person parenting time despite court orders from, from before the pandemic and despite ACS and federal guidance encouraging agencies to remain open and continue to facilitate in-person visits. Based on an internal survey of CFR's clients, approximately 75% of our clients' visits were completely virtual after March 13th, 2020. Alarmingly, of these families, 36% of the children were under the age of three and over 50% were under the age of five. Parents of any child at that young age recognize how difficult it is to engage meaningfully with them by phone or on screen, no less to develop or maintain a parent-child bond. Even today, while in-person visits may have resumed, many families continue to have in-person visits only once per week or every other week, compared to the two times per week that they had normally prior to the pandemic. Agencies and ACS are not moving quickly enough to restore pre-pandemic levels of visitation. This failure will have devastating and long-term effects on the reunification of the black and brown families most impacted by New York City's family regulation system. Virtual visitation cannot substitute for in-person family time, and yet regular frequent visits between parents and children is nearly always a prerequisite to children returning home. Federal law instructs agencies to seek to terminate a parent's rights to their children permanently and forever when they have been separated for 15 out of 22 months absent and compelling reason not to do so. This law was not suspended or modified during the pandemic, which means our clients are at greater risk of losing their rights to raise their children through no fault of their own. Agencies should critically examine each case and find a compelling reason not to file a termination proceeding when parents have been unable to visit and plan due to the pandemic. We call on city council to push ACS and agencies to address the harm of suspended and reduced visitation in the following ways. Direct ACS to report on the specific visitation each foster care agency has offered to families separated during the pandemic. This report should include the number of families, changes in visits at the beginning of the pandemic, and any improvement in visits in each of those families' situations by quarter. This should include the number of families who to date do not have visits which comport with ACS's own guidelines. Direct. Um, you finished, go ahead. Thank you. Direct ACS and each agency to report on what, if any, efforts they made to facilitate visits where a lack of technology impacted the family and the number of families who were actually assisted. Invest Also invest in community-based organizations that can supervise visits in the community, for example, YMCA's, churches, and other community organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Heimberg. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm now going to call on our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order. Halima Washington, Abigail Lyons, and Anna Blondel. And we're going to begin with Halima. Clock is Hello. I'm sorry, what happened? Yes. Clock is ready, you may begin. Okay, thank you. My name is Halima Washington, and I'm, not, I'm here representing Rise Magazine. This is a group of impacted parents, parents that are impacted by the child welfare system. Um, and I'm also here representing myself as a community member in Hunts Point, where one of the FECs or the Family Enrichment Centers is located. And I am here to oppose the expansion of the Family Enrichment Centers. Um, 
One of the reasons is that ACS has a history of disproportionately targeting and punishing black and brown families and having these family enrichment centers will not enrich the family at all. They're actually family entrapment centers. Although these centers are um, gonna be operated through nonprofit organizations, what we do know is once things are, once, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Once we, use community responses within systems, somehow those community responses are always co-opted and messed up because systems are designed to not see the humanity in folks and constantly dehumanize black and brown communities. And so having family enrichment centers that are at arm's length away from ACS is not what we want. We want community centers that are directly supported and overseen by community-based organizations with no ACS involvement at all, because ACS has a history of, as I said, disproportionately targeting and punishing Black and Brown families and communities. We want more community investment. We want ACS to be abolished and we want the systems that continue to oppress black and brown communities to also be abolished. Part of, also we want uh, more community investment, more investment in community led solutions and solutions that center and respect the leadership of the impacted communities in which they claim to support. And with that, I am complete. Thank you very much, Ms. Washington. Thank you, Halima, for your testimony. I'm now going to call on Abigail Lyons. Doc is ready. Thank you for this opportunity. I am an education supervisor for the Fair Futures Road to Success um, citywide tutoring program. I am also a former New York City public school teacher. This past year and a half has been particularly difficult for youth in care, which has already been said, but through the Fair Futures um, program, kids in care can receive weekly one-on-one -on -one tutoring as well as coaching and support from an education, an education specialist. Our students need and deserve these supports. With remote schooling, kids lost the safety, consistency, and trusted relationships of their schools. Um, and these are particularly important to kids in care who have experienced so much uncertainty and so many transitions throughout their lives. Kids have expressed challenges with feeling unmotivated and confused by online classes, tech issues, not being able to find a quiet place to focus, and most concerningly, kids have been experiencing more mental health challenges that have often made schoolwork insurmountable. This said, Kids in Care also showed us their amazing perseverance and strength. Our youth's attendance and utilization of Fair Futures tutoring services increased. Many looked forward to their weekly sessions and often asked for extra sessions. It gave them the one-on-one -on -one attention to navigate tech issues, to ask content questions, and practice skills with feedback and encouragement. Tutoring also provided our students with the interpersonal relationships they were desperately missing. Students see their tutors as mentors, asking about where they attended college and discussing possible extracurriculars and career paths. Even before the pandemic, as a city, we were not meeting the educational needs of our most vulnerable students, specifically those in foster care. The DOE is a complex system. Youth in foster care deserve advocates to help them navigate their education. Perhaps most importantly, they need consistency in their education through weekly tutoring. Many kids in care are several grade levels behind in reading and math. If year after year they sit in a classroom not understanding what's going on and feeling embarrassed about their skills without getting any real support, why wouldn't they choose to disengage from school? The learning loss from this year has disproportionately affected our most vulnerable students, but our students are still eager to learn. Many students are opting into summer tutoring 
because of the strong relationships they built over the school year with their tutors and because they want to build their skills. Our, our kids in care want to learn and excel in school. Now it is up to the city to support them by pr prioritizing full funding for Fair Futures. If the city takes kids into their care, they absolutely must care for and support these students' futures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lyons. Thank you. And I, just for the record, the council is very, very dedicated to the Fair Futures model and, and, uh, and uh, expanding it baseline. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. I am now going to call on Anna Blondel, and then after Anna, the following panel is going to be in this order of speaking: Imani Worthy, Joyce McMillan, Anna Ahrens, and Catherine Wormfeld. We are going to begin now with Anna Blondel. Well, Thank you. Ready. Thank you so much. My name is Anna Blondel. I am a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society Juvenile Rights Practice. Um, our office represents children at the center of the child welfare matters in New York. Um, and many of those children are placed in foster care through the family court. Um, we thank you for having this important hearing. Today, I want to focus on a single ongoing crisis that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, the increasing number of kids being removed from their families and the simultaneous lack of foster homes for them in New York City. Um, it is the children of New York um, who have faced the most unimaginable challenges over the past year and who have struggled to persevere throughout the pandemic. Black and brown children continue to be removed from their parents and placed in foster care at a disproportionately high rate, causing trauma to the child, to their families, and to their communities. During the pandemic, the number of children ACS removed from their parents dropped significantly. Per Commissioner Hansel's testimony today, that dip in reporting and consequently in emergency removals does not appear to have resulted in an increased harm to children. However, recently, ACS has been removing more black and brown children and placing them in care. This increase in removals should stop particularly because ACS lacks sufficient foster, home, foster homes for the children it removes, subjecting them to additional harm. As Commissioner Hansel has testified, foster care wide, 42% of children have been placed with kinship resources. But that means that almost 60% of children are not in homes with relatives or fictive kin. Many of those children instead have been languishing at the children's center and at other pre-placement centers due to a lack of foster homes. Last year, at least 153 children were held in the children's center for over 20 days. That signals that there is, in fact, a shortage of foster homes, as children as young as eight years old spend up to eight months waiting for a home, as siblings waited, again, for up to eight months for a home. Children who are older have special needs or are medically fragile, typically experience the longest waits. Shortly, I hope you will hear from Irma Rodriguez about what it's actually like for a child, especially a special needs child, to be held at the Children's Center during the pandemic. And while, as Commissioner Hansel stated, the length of stay may not have increased, the experience of staying at the Children's Center during the pandemic is unimaginably more frightening and more stressful. The isolation could not be worse and extended stays at the Children's Center are uniquely dangerous during COVID. Kids are exposed to more people, causing children as young as three years old to need to isolate or quarantine for weeks at a time. Some of our clients have not seen their family for months in person, and when they have fallen sick, they are sick alone without being nurtured or held. I'm mixed by. You could go ahead and, you could go ahead and finish. Thank you so much. Children languished at the Children's Center prior to COVID, but the number of new foster homes recruited has declined during the pandemic by at least 165 homes. And that drop does not, need, does not account for the number of homes that have closed due to fear of infection or loss. So it is entirely unclear what building back looks like in the context of an ongoing pandemic. And as a result, this shortage has gotten worse and children are languishing at the Children's Center or being pushed into congregate placements. We have some concrete requests of city council. Provide support for families rather than removing their children. Require comprehensive reporting about the length of stay at the children's center and other pre-placement facilities, about the number of available foster homes that take in older special needs and medically fragile youth. 
limit the time a child can languish in pre-placement and incentivize more foster families who want to care for older youth with increased financial and structural supports. This is a crisis and we are asking for city council's help. Thank you very much, Blundell, thank you. Thank you, Anna. I'm now going to call on the following panel. Again, the next panel is going to be comprised of Imani Worthy, Joyce McMillan, Anna Ahrens, and Catherine Wormfeld. And we are going to begin with Imani Worthy. Uh, hello. Hi, hello. My name is Imani Worthy, and I'm a parent leader at RISE. ACS has plans to expand its family enrichment centers from three to 33. Impacted parents are not happy about this. ACS has a reputation for treating Black families punitively. Our words have been manipulated, our parenting have, has been villainized, and our children were taken away from this institution. Even though my investigation was over two years ago, we are still healing from the effects of that trauma today. RISE has been actively asking parents what they want in their communities. During lockdown, we first held community conversations via Zoom to get feedback on how parents envisioned their communities. I was not technically a part of staff and took part in these conversations. Ironically, not one single parent in these conversations advocated for any type of system connected to the family policing system, otherwise known as ACS. After becoming a part of staff, I joined two more programs, the participatory action research and peer advocate model, where more parents gathered and started visioning what they wanted to see in their communities without system involvement. Peer Advocate Model began conducting research to all types of organizations who were restoring communities through COVID. We wanted to create a resource guide for peer supporters to refer to whenever they needed anything before system involvement. This is deeper than prevention. Prevention is still tied to the family policing system. Prevention workers are still mandated reporters. We don't trust mandated reporters. The Participatory Action Research Program continued to plan and host community conversations and surveys with impacted parents. Many people feel that the family policing system needs to reckon with its past and harming many, so many Black and Brown communities. Instead of dancing over the obvious, playing nice, playing nice is simply not enough. Simply saying a mother has a right to be upset if her child is being, a taken, being taken away. If she, if she doesn't, there's a problem. You have ruined so many lives. You have robbed us of so much. Every time my two-year-old runs around and gets hurt, I'm already formulating in my mind how to explain to his doctor that he was playing and hurting and he just hurt himself. I am worried I will be judged by someone who does not know me or my son, but is some type of expert on child abuse. There are credible messengers, black owned grassroots organizations such as Movement for Family Power, Justice for Families and RISE who are already doing the work to enrich our communities. Small grassroots organizations may not have the capacity, funds or resources to create a quality grant letter to the government. By allowing these enrichment center grants to be handed out on a first come first serve basis is another example of your racist and classist tendencies. I'm How can fine. you claim to support black and brown? And Thank you. How can you claim to support black and brown communities and not even consider this? This is just another example of stating the obvious but really not doing anything to show for it. We do not want your involvement in any of our affairs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Worthy. And I, I just want to just acknowledge you pointed out, um, you know, that when when your uh, two year old uh, falls down, you have to you have to think about, um, uh, you know, how a, a doctor might per perceive that, and and I. You know, I, I want to contrast that with with my experience as a white person. Um, when my two year old falls down, I don't have to think about that. I think that that is a a important to acknowledge um, and um, and put and put front and center that there is that abs there's absolutely a disparity 
um, within the system of mandated reporters and every and society in general um, as they um, uh, as they perceive um, uh, uh, white parents and black parents, and it's, it's, it needs to be a, um, constantly put forward. So I appreciate you. Thanks again, Imani. I'll now call on Joyce McMillan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, council member and chair, Steve Levin, um, General Welfare Committee. You know, Steve, Hi, there's never enough time for me to get through this. There is so much to say. ACS is horrible, right? And they listen to parents and then they create this narrative of acting like they're implementing the things that parents say they want. And they're the most dishonest people that I've ever met in a lifetime. Um, Frederick Douglass once asked, why am I a slave? And I asked continuously, why is it only black and brown children in this system that's so horrific with these extremely poor outcomes if this is a system meant for safety of children? I've said it before and I'll say it a thousand times again. If foster care was a good thing, we would only get into affirmative action. I've been partnering with Movement for Family Power, um, Ancient, Doula, Ancient Song Doula and other organizations giving out Pampers. A few weeks ago in Brooklyn, we gave out 16,000 Pampers, JMAC for Families and these other orgs uh, because parents need things that are tangible. Surveillance is not support. And I know I'm gonna go over my time. It's what I always, okay. and I'm gonna start my testimony now. But I just needed to say those things because the testimony just does not capture it all, Steve. Understood. Thank you again. Okay, so my family was ripped apart by ACS after my urine tested positive for an illicit substance. From the start, ACS assumed that I could not properly care for my children. They assumed this even though they never found any harm to my children. Instead, they claimed future risk of harm. They built their case against me through an invasive investigation of my family, an investigation I will, willingly went along with because I did not know my rights. When ACS began its investigation of me, I had no prior involvement with ACS and had no idea that trusting their child protection specialist and being honest with them would lead to a two and a half year separation of my family. I went into this situation believing ACS's exaggerations of the truth, but also knowing my children were well cared for. I had nothing to hide. Throughout the investigation, the CPS worker I met with told me, um, they demanded um, that I follow all of ACS's steps for a full investigation of me. CPS told me any refusal to cooperate would be a sign of guilt and evidence that I could not care for my children. At the time, I did not know ACS was the family police. So I didn't see a need for an attorney. I wish I understood then what I understand now. And I wish I'm so. Sorry. Go ahead, Joyce, you can finish, yeah, go ahead. During their investigation, ACS searched my home, strip searched my children and interrogated my neighbors, my children's pediatricians and all of my supports. They destroyed family relationships in addition to traumatizing me and my children. And they never once conducted an assessment of the well-being of my children. Instead, they treated the urine like a parenting test but that urine did not speak to who I was as a parent. It did not show that I used a substance in front of my children or put them in danger. It did not indicate harm had been caused to my children and it did not speak to my character. But because I did not know my rights and I trusted ACS, they were able to use that test and their investigation to destroy my family. I believe the family separation would not have happened had I known my rights and had I been Mirandarized. We need to recognize that ACS is the family police, that there is, that it is clear from ACS's own attitude and their own policies. In 2018, an article in the Daily News reported that the city spent roughly $10 million 
for a new high-tech facility in Harlem and one in Jamaica, Queens, which included state-of-the-art simulation rooms, complete with audio of barking dogs, humans screaming, breaking glass and loud music at trainees as they prepared to go through the door. Commissioner Hansel said those training practices was molded, modeled after the NYPD Academy. ACS has a policy to call the police when a parent does not open their door, even though it is the parent's right not to open their door if the worker does not have a court order. Calling the police on a nonviolent person who's exercising their rights is not only abusive, it's racist, as we know who it is that ACS investigates disproportionately. I call that the Karen policy of ACS that puts Black lives in danger, and Black lives do matter, ACS. Even as, the, even as they operate like the police and work alongside the police, ACS has an advantage over the police right now, even though the stakes of ACS investigations are just as high, if not higher, than the criminal justice investigations, ACS can police families without affording parents their rights or safeguards or telling them anything that would keep their family safe from their intrusive and irresponsible behavior that separates families unnecessarily. Without the protection of Miranda rights, families like me who have not been investigated before do not know that ACS does not does full-fledged um, investigations, thorough investigations where anything you say can and will be held against you and used against you later in court. People don't know that they don't have to let ACS examine their children's naked bodies or let ACS into their house or open every cabinet drawer and that they don't have to have ACS's drug tests during investigations. Police, people don't know that decisions to separate families are made most times even before ACS goes to court. And that's why children are removed pre-court order. Um, families are not assigned legal representation until after the case is filed. And often um, after the children are removed and that ACS investigations can last up to 60 days before a final decision is made. Parents don't know they have, that if their children are taken away and their case ends up in court, they will only get a few minutes with a legal counsel before going into that hearing. I'm gonna to skip to the end. The Family Miranda Rights Act does not create any new rights for families. It requires child protection services to notify parents and caregivers of their existing rights orally and in writing at the onset of the investigation before they participate in any investigations that can carry lifelong impacts parents deserve to know the allegations being made against them they need to know that they can speak to a lawyer they need to know that their words can be used against them and they are not required to let acs into their homes and acs should not be calling police on families that is a horrible thing it needs to stop immediately anytime a black family comes into the contact with nypd it can go wrong it can go very wrong and they have a process to follow and they need to follow it and stop calling the police on families thank you for allowing me to go above and beyond as i always do um, I'm going to hate to see you leave at the end of this term, Mr. Levin, and I hope that families can get together with you prior to your leaving office. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you. That would be great, Joyce. I look forward to, to seeing you in person. I, it's, it's been far too long, so it's, um, and I appreciate the kind words, um, and, I, and I appreciate um, uh, you bringing these issues to light, uh, particularly the issue around calling um, the police on on instances where people are um, expressing their um, constitutional rights on the on the Miranda type bill, um, we are we're working on that, and I'd love to um, uh, uh, talk with you after the hearing on on um, on the progress that we're making on that legislation. I anticipate passing that legislation by the end of, by the end of this year uh, at the very latest. But hopefully before that. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. This is you. Thanks again, Joyce, for your testimony. I'm now going to call on Anna Ahrens, followed by Catherine Wormfeld. Over to Anna. Clock is ready. Thank you. My name is Anna Ahrens, and I'm an acting assistant professor at NYU School of Law. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. 
I have spent the last year studying how the family regulation system in the city changed during COVID and the effect of those changes on child safety. I have a paper on this topic forthcoming this fall. My research makes clear the many ways in which ACS's quote unquote normal operations needlessly brutalize, traumatize, and police poor Black and Latinx families in the name of child safety. I say that because my most important finding is this. ACS's own data, as you heard earlier today, shows that even as the family regulation system shrunk to about half its normal size, children stayed just as safe. Children were not endangered by staying at home with their families and in their communities, in part because at the same time that ACS was forced to step back, mutual aid networks grew astronomically and families received new forms of cash assistance from the government, allowing them the autonomy and the resources to meet their own needs. As you've heard today, the city shut down last spring forced a radical reduction of the family regulation system in terms of reports, investigations, filings, and removals. Of note, even though ACS has retained its power to file new cases where it does seek to separate families, only half as many children were placed in foster care as a result of ACS's applications for removals in spring 2020 as compared to a year earlier. This dramatic drop suggests that during the shutdown, ACS began assessing more rigorously the cases in which it might seek a removal, and as a result, holding off on filing some cases where it typically would have sought a removal. This gives credence to an argument long made by parents and their advocates, that in normal times, ACS seeks unnecessary removals, not because of concerns of child safety, but because of other issues with parents, such as their quote unquote lack of cooperation. Overall though, ACS's decreased operations had no adverse effect on child safety based on several metrics, some of which Commissioner Hansel alluded to earlier, uh, but I wanna highlight a few now. Um, First, during the COVID shutdown, the number of child fatalities dropped. Um, and just as a baseline, we all know that child fatalities are extremely tragic and extremely rare, but they do often drive child welfare policies. But these are also precisely the kind of tragedy that are the most difficult to underreport or hide even during a national crisis. But compared to the same period a year earlier, child fatality reports dropped by 25% in the shutdown period in early COVID. Second, there has not been any so-called rebound effect. That is, even as children have begun to return to schools and public life has resumed, the number of reports received has not reached previous levels, let alone surpassed previous levels, as we might expect if reporters had to catch up and report past concerns that they had been unable to before. Third, the rate of substantiation for reports has not risen. Even now, only about 35% of investigations find that the allegations were founded. This is the same rate as before the pandemic. Had mandated reporters returned to their positions and reported an influx of valid concerns from a backlog, we would have expected that rate would have jumped higher. Time would... expired. You can go ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish. Thank, okay. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Uh, the steady rate of uh, substantiations at 35% is even more significant considering that, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Past research shows that uh, where agencies have fewer reports to investigate, their investigations overall become more accurate and more thorough. In light of these numbers, we cannot say that ACS's normal model is necessary for child safety. Instead, this last year represents a rare opportunity, a rupture that made it impossible to continue with business as usual and that forced all of us to reconsider the status quo in all areas of our lives, including child safety in the city. The last year can serve as a model in some ways of a more humane and more equitable path forward, showing us that we need not destroy families and destroy communities in order to keep children safe. Instead, we can address child poverty and child safety by providing families the monetary support they need without strings attached and without policing involved, and by building robust community support networks separate and apart from any services provided by ACS. We need not and cannot ever go back to business as usual. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, um, I would love to um, uh, have a follow-up conversation with you in anticipation of your, um, uh, your report coming out. What's the, what's the format of your report? Um, it's a paper that will be published in a, one of Columbia's law journals in the fall, um, but it is available as a preprint now, and I included that in the written testimony, but I would obviously happily follow up with you in addition to that as well. Great. It seems as if you and uh, we we were thinking along this, the same lines of what um, of what um, information we can impart from the last uh, fifteen months and um, and how we can um, take that information in the future. So I appreciate your your testimony. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you, Anna. I'm now going to call on Catherine Wormfeld. And after Catherine, we are going to have testify Shatavia Hurt and Irma Rodriguez. Over to Catherine now, Catherine Wormfeld. Clock is ready. Thank you and good afternoon, uh, Chair Levin and esteemed council members of the General Welfare Committee. Since its inception 25 years ago, the Center for Court Innovation has maintained a vision to reduce unnecessary and harmful involvement in the justice system wherever possible and to build public safety and well being through sustainable solutions. The Center's longstanding partnership with Council has helped bring this vision to life through evidence based and racially just programming. Among the issues we focus on in the justice system is the welfare of infants and parents involved in family court child neglect and separation proceedings. The Center for Court Innovation's Strong Starts Court Initiative serves children from birth age uh, to three years old who are subjects of child protection cases in the New York City family courts and their parents and families. And there are more than 10,000 currently on the family court dockets. The primary intervention is a clinical coordinator who convenes monthly clinical conferences um, between parents, attorneys, caseworkers, and clinical service providers to help resolve issues outside of the courtroom as much as possible and to ensure parents have a voice in determining what their family needs in order to recover from the crises in which they find themselves. Critically, Strong Starts clinicians help families, court teams understand intergenerational histories of trauma and systemic oppression that are characteristic in families and the pain and despair that often underlies uncooperative or otherwise confusing parental responses to child welfare system practitioners and demands. Throughout the pandemic, our coordinators found innovative ways to engage with families to help them navigate a judicial and child welfare process that has been strained, which has delayed reunification and hindered case progress during the ongoing crisis. Strong Starts coordinators have facilitated contacts between parents and children who were removed in ways that minimize trauma from the separation and ultimately plan for, re for reunification. Our coordinators have been virtually bringing attorneys and parties together with interdisciplinary and cross systems conferences to problem solve and find supports for parents to be able to safely care for their children. They also provide critical information and detailed clinical reports about parental strengths and capacities and risk to children to assist judges in making the decision whether to remove a child from their home. This has ensured that families remain connected to services and are able to engage with them. This work has helped prevent removals and hastened reunification in a critical number of cases. Strong Starts began as a pilot program in the Bronx in 2015, expanded to Queens in 2016, Staten Island in 2018, and was able to launch in Brooklyn at the height of the pandemic in February of 2021. The family court enthusiastically supported this latest expansion despite the challenges of operating during a pandemic because it recognized how the model with its collaborative and science informed approach was even more critical to supporting families and transforming system responses during a crisis. For these reasons, we're now asking Council to bring strong starts to every borough in New York City by funding implementation in Manhattan with a $220,000 budget request so that we may provide these critical services to more families. The Center for Court Innovation thanks City Council for you go ahead and, finish it. Part and stands ready to continue implementing its programming toward the goal of improving the welfare of all New Yorkers, improving public safety by addressing racial disparities and histories of trauma and structural inequities, strengthening families and reducing intergenerational cycles of system involvement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. I am noting that Councilmember Rosenthal has her hand raised. Over to Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, Chair, for this extraordinary hearing, as always, and to the, all the advocates who are coming forward telling us what's really happening on the ground. Um, it's incredibly important. Catherine, did you happen to listen to the um, the administration's testimony in our questioning? I did, yes. So really, again, with this preface that this is not my table, this isn't my area of knowledge, and so I'm going to say something not accurate, but they talked about a program I think it was called Safe Forward. Had, do you, are you familiar with that program? 
Um, and I ask because Center for Corn Innovation, I count on you guys and you're always so innovative. And I know you're thinking about restorative justice. Um, so I, I wondered if you knew about this program, what you thought. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Um, I actually made a note to myself to follow up about that program because I wasn't familiar with it. Um, and I also have a number of colleagues who work on um, abusive partner intervention programming as well as restorative justice practices. Um, and so we always collaborate on those kinds of things. So I, I made a note to, to raise this with my, um, with my colleagues to see you know, to see whether anyone else was aware and then also to follow up with ACS about how we could help support that. Fantastic, terrific. Uh, if you could just drop me a line when you learn anything, I really appreciate it. You can reach me, Helen, at HelenRosenthal.com. Um, but also I found it strange when I asked about who was doing it, I specifically asked, assuming that you were doing it. But he said, no, it's a one, it's a consultant which I found also very strange. Um, okay, great. So let's stay in touch. I appreciate you and all your hard work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rosenthal. Thanks again, Catherine. I wanna note for everyone who is on today that we are going to be doing a last call before the end of this hearing for anyone who wasn't called and does wish to testify. Just, just make a note that you will be given an opportunity at the very end of this hearing. Now going to call on Shatavia Hurt, followed by Irma Rodriguez. Over to Shatavia. Okay. Uh, good afternoon all. I'm Shatavia Hurt from Staten Island, North Shore. I'm the executive director of Free of Staten Island. I'm also a part of the RISE Parent Leadership Program conducted by RISE Magazine. Today, I'm gonna to testify about the expansion of the family enrichment centers and the funding that will go to the FPCs. Community leaders and local organizations across New York City have really banded together through the pandemic. In my own community and other communities throughout New York City, small business owners have set up community refrigerators, pantries to help fight food insecurity during the pandemic. Local artists have set up free virtual art classes, theater, story time for children and teens. These classes have provided respite for exhausted parents throughout the pandemic and at the same time created a positive outlet for children. Children that were trapped inside the apartment during this pandemic. Community leaders have, have reached into their own pockets to purchase, whether it be food, diapers, Zoom license and materials needed to support their surrounding communities. It didn't take them four years training to deal with families or building 30 FECs to help out their community that was in a crisis. Their response was immediate and felt throughout New York City. The funding should be reallocated directly to these organizations and individuals to help expand their community outreach. Besides the millions that will go into these FECs, ACS already has over 2.6 billion in funding. Over the past couple of years, many parents have said to me in a professional and casual setting, I have gone to ACS for help, help to prevent having an ACS case or help during an ongoing ACS investigation and ACS wasn't able to help me because they lacked the funding, which is very surprising. It doesn't add up. In some cases, ACS did refer them to smaller organizations that don't even have a fraction of the funding ACS has for child welfare. That doesn't add up to me also. People have come to me and my organization for clothing and food because of fear that if they ask ACS for help, they would get an ACS case. So there's no trust and there's a deep fear of ACS in our black and brown communities. Why would a parent wanna go to ACS at these FECs for help when they don't trust their system? I myself have had ACS involvement three years ago and it's traumatized me and my now seven-year-old daughter. Someone made a false anonymous claim against me and I was investigated. Every time my doorbell rings to this day, I have unexpectedly, I have a fear that a ACS will investigate me for months on a baseless claim. The ACS system is intrusive and it's racist. I'm also calling on the New York City Comptroller, the New York City Comptroller candidates running in this upcoming election to audit and investigate ACS. There should be continually, continuous um, eight audits 
to ensure that the funding is going towards prevention of removing children from their homes, most of which are children in black and brown communities. That's all. Thank you so much, Ms. Hurt. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much, Latavia, for your testimony. Now I'm going to turn to Irma Rodriguez. Clock is ready. Hi, my name is Irma Rodriguez. I'm a proud sister of a child with autism, bipolar disorder, and ADHD. Our experience with the Children's Center was horrible during the COVID-19 pandemic. My brother length of stay was four months plus months. During his stay, he encountered staff that cursed at him because they were frustrated. I also witnessed how the staff would allow him to stay with his face dirty and wear dirty clothes. Due to their lack of care for his safety and cleanliness, he ended up diagnosed with COVID-19. The treatment they provided when my brother was COVID-19 positive highlighted the lack of preparedness. They put him in a room by himself, no TV, no sheets, no food, no shower, only a laptop for entertainment. One will call this solitary confinement which was not appropriate for a child with his mental capacity, all documented and sent it to his advocates. And it wasn't until then when ACS did the right thing and corrected their treatment with a pushback of denial. Even though school at the time was remote, ACS assigned a one-to-one -to, -one to my brother. They couldn't get him up on time to make his virtual classes. Even though I would call ahead of time to assure he would attend or would get, I would get lied to by staff, they would tell me he is up only to end up getting emails from his teachers. The days they did get him up on time, they were not in a private setting. He couldn't stay focused because there were so many distractions, such as kids screaming, staff talking in the background, some children making inappropriate gestures on his camera. There were times where they couldn't find his laptop. He missed nearly 492 assignments. This is not even an exaggeration. Virtual visits, if they, I didn't have, virtual visits, if I didn't call, to remind them I wouldn't have them, or I would receive a call after the time that was pre-planned. Visits in person, they always had an excuse as to why they weren't able to drop him off on time. Traffic, short staff, etc. This would cause me to lose visits as I live in a different state. It got so bad I had to step in by having him one week on and one week off without ACS providing me financial assistance or any assistance other than transporting him one, one way to me. ACS was notified not uh, several times I needed help by me, by me and his advocate, but due to their response, they had to figure something out. I was in a position where I had to figure it out, adding more stress to an already stressful situation. My brother was bullied by other kids. Glasses were stepped on by other children, fights, glasses not replaced on a timely manner. I could go on and on. This is all while have him having a one-to-one, -one, by the way but I only have three minutes. I just want to say I'm here to speak up for those like my brother that I cannot, cannot speak for themselves. Please do better. Not every child has family members so involved in their daily life as I am with my brother or able to take a financial hit as I did and still do just to continue to be there for him. These are human beings. We trust that children entering the ACS care enter in a safe place. It is believed it is your job to make them feel loved, safe and supported in such a difficult time in their life. I'm asking for you to please work on being part of the solution and not the problem. Time expired. You, Thank you, Mr. You could go ahead and finish, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you. To you, it might be just one case, but to us, the family is one case too many. Lastly, I want to thank my brother's advocate, Sarah Bodak, and her team. Each and every time I encounter and continue to encounter any issue, she and her team are ready to stand up for my brother full force to make sure his needs are met without hesitation. If it wasn't for her and her team, I fear he would be just another sad story and statistic. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Irma, for your testimony. At this time, we have heard from everyone who signed up to testify. We appreciate all of your time and your presence. If at this point we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please at this point use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order of hand, hands raised. So I am seeing that Joyce McMillan or what is, the individual who is listed as Joyce McMillan in our in our panelists would like to testify. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacinta Jagasar, and I am ACS Justice Impacted. Um, ACS has deprived me of not seeing my children for the last 16 months. They have mentally hazed my children, myself, and my parents. They denied my parents access to um, supervised visits, as well as court ordered mandated reporters. ACS has terrorized our home, has interfered with our medical care, violated our HIPAA rights, and have literally created a attack against our homes. We are calling for protection through the memorandum rights. We did not know ACS was the family police. We did not know ACS can manipulate your testimony and those false statements can be released to the family court. We did not know that ACS can sabotage your paperwork and say you volunteered to put your children in forced care when you never did. We are hurt. We have been shamed. We have been robbed of our dignity. We are asking for ACS to wear body cams. We are asking for city council to invest in parents, to fight for their kids, to be able to fight against domestic violence. My children were denied their IEP services, which is a mandated court document. We had a family time with our children and were only given two hours during the week at the library when it was closed. We are calling for justice and the suspension and termination of Neji Baraj position as a social worker, Constance, Jennifer Goldstein, the entire department needs to be held accountable for their egregious police misconduct that was conducted towards my family, my children and I, and that will leave a legacy of abuse, racialized trauma and fear that no parent in the state of New York or any state should ever experience. We are totally ashamed of our elected officials for allowing this atrocity to continue to operate in the community. We are demanding that they get fired immediately along with the prosecutor, Stella Bratos. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And Jacinda, if, if, um, if you want to follow up with my office um, uh, moving forward, you can send an email uh, to S. Levin, uh, that's my first initial and last name, at council.nyc.gov. And, and whatever assistance we can give moving forward, um, we're happy to do. So Ms. Elizabeth has helped us tremendously, but again, no outside resource can help us. Even as the respondent, I have no idea what's happening in these cases. I'm not given so, court reports. I'm not given um, notices of when court appearances are happening. It's a complete injustice. So we will reach out to the office uh, again. Yeah, uh, just, to, just to be clear, Elizabeth is, is no longer at the office. So um, I'll touch base with her to make sure we have your contact. But if I can ask for anything, I would ask for the ACS charges to be dropped, to reunify us with our family, and then to expeditiously reinstate my children back into their homeschool in New York City. We had to leave the state of New York on political asylum and fear that ACS was going to place our children into a stranger's home and force the care. And I did not want to end up in Beckford Corrections defending my family and exercising my second constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you, Jacinta. Thank you for your testimony, Jacinta. I now see that there are two hands raised. Um, the first is Joyce McMillan, one. Hi. Time begins. Okay, yes, my name is Dewan Collins. I'm a parent affected and also a member of Parent Legislation Action Network plan. Um, in 2007, my son, I had so much that my son living in Rosedale, Queens. My son's name is Isaiah. Um, at that time, there was a false report that was made anonymously against me, um, but I knew who it was. It was my landlord because 
I had got HDD involved for him to make the uh, upgrade to the apartment for my for me to receive my son out of foster care. Um, all he needed to do was to place a fire extinguisher and install um, iron gates on the windows. And because of that, and he violated, they fined him. And he turned around and filed a false report saying I was having drugs and wild orgies in my home, which wasn't true. So ACS came into my home. I didn't know my rights. Um, they was very intrusive. They strip searched my son right in front of me, went through my refrigerator. Everything was good. And I'm like, I'm telling them, I know where the report is coming from because I'm a good dad. You know, I was going to school as a paralegal and I was donating my time back in the schools at uh, Rikers Island Law Library and taking care of my son as a single parent. Um, so I'm a good dad, right? And all these things came into my home when ACS came in and I was just like distraught because they was making me want to take a urine test. And then I contacted uh, Steve Wop and that's how I met Joyce. And then she informed me what, what my rights were. And then that's when I started to start researching social service law. And I started finding out some things. And then unfortunately I had got incarcerated. I had got locked up, um, which had nothing to do with my son. And at that time, uh, my son was in the care of my, grand my, my mom, which is my son's paternal grandmother. And she came up from uh, out of state to take care of him. And um, they came in and removed my son under the guise of an emergency removal. My mom is a registered nurse and there was food in the home. So I didn't know what the emergency was. No one ever told me anything. I didn't find out my son was in foster care until two months later. Um, and at that time, um, there was a lot of things that wasn't explained to me. You know, I wasn't informed of my, my rights, um, like to an attorney, um, things of that nature. It was just, it was just horrible. And come to find out that the attorney that I did have didn't inform me of my right to appeal the removal order because there was no emergency. I had to fight to get the transcripts to find out that there was no emergency. So basically they kidnapped my son and now my son has been illegally adopted. All the process that has been um, done from the time that my son was removed up until the adoption has been illegal, has been without any due process whatsoever. Um, the false, uh, the false care agency, Grand Windham, they was responsible for planning with me while I was in prison, but sent me two letters stating that due to my incarceration, I cannot plan for my son. Therefore, the birth mom is the primary resource planner and to this date has been not complying with her service plan. The agency is seeking a goal change from return to parent to adoption. And they tried to get me to surrender my yeah, they tried to get me to surrender my parental rights. And I'm like, why should I have to surrender my parental rights when he has a grandmother who wants them? She they they, uh, ICPC was approved. The state of New York agreed to pay for the placement of my son in Chicago with his grandmother. She became a, 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 a kinship foster parent. They fingerprinted her and everything, her and my sister. And the, the, the planning agency did not put in the necessary paperwork to put my son um, in Chicago. All they had to do was make the permanency report to be um, placed in with a willing and fit relative. And they didn't do that. It been returned to parent for three years and then it went to adoption. And uh, how old is your child now? He's now 14. And through the grace of God, I just recently saw him only because I never gave up my fight to find my son and reunite my son with his family. And I asked him, I showed him pictures of his family. He didn't even recognize his own family. The only one he recognized was his grandmother. He has brothers and sisters everywhere on both sides. So why is it that my son was adopted if he got family members on both sides who was there for him in the beginning? Why? I'm sorry. That's um. A very when did the adoption? When did the adoption go through? 2018. And very, um, are you fighting? Are you are you pursuing the legal recourse with that? I'm 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 waiting for the timing with, with all the elections and everything going on. You know, so everything is about timing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but there was a, um a social worker by the name of Barry Shafkin. I had a conversation with him when I was in prison. Um, he said to me that he told them they had a training session going on and they gave him a scenario of a case. And at the end, the caseworker, Marjorie Jean of Grand Winham said that that was their case. And he said, yeah, you're right. That is your case. It is the worst case of social work that we've ever seen in our life. Why is this child in foster care if he had family that came for him? My mom put it in a custody petition, a guardianship petition. The agencies never responded to it. 
And they kept trying to get me to surrender my parental rights, and I wouldn't. So they took them. And they didn't even have the jurisdiction to do that, but they did it. And nobody has helped me. They, everybody has covered it up. So I believe that ACS has to be abolished entirely because they have failed in a mission. They have failed my family and tore my family apart. They fought to put my son on psychotropic meds when I was in prison. And when I came home, I told them, I said, my son doesn't have ADHD. He has separation anxiety disorder. I'm reading the progress notes. He's saying dad, dad, bye, bye. Dad, dad, gone. He understood at that very young age that his daddy was no longer around. And then he's acting up, bumping his head up against the wall. That's not ADHD. So when I, when I got a second medical opinion, um, the agency tried to give, it, uh, give me one of their doctors again. I said, no, that's not a second medical opinion. I said a second medical opinion is me finding my own doctor. So I got an attorney who uh, helped me get a second medical opinion. And he basically mirrored my, uh, my thoughts on that. And it is that it's, my son suffered from separation anxiety disorder. Next thing you know, my attorney tells me, but your rights are going to be terminated anyway. So it makes no sense to overturn the decision to place my son on psychotropic meds. And the, and the foster mom was just doing it to get the, uh, the, uh, the uh, incentive money. That's all she wanted. She was using my son. She got, I got progress notes that said, can I keep him? Can I keep him? She's overstepping her bounds as a foster parent. The foster parent should deliver a child to the, to the family, not 70% of the time, 80% of the time, 99% of the time when they feel like it, 100% of the time. And she's failed. ACS has failed. Everybody's failed my family. Now, now I'm telling y'all, so I want to know what's going to be done about it. Because I have all the proof and the evidence. You guys are accountable for what happened to my family. Um, can you um, follow up with, with my office? Um, I, this, is, this is the first time that I'm, I'm hearing about your case, but if, I'm happy to do help in whatever way I can. Um, you know, my, just, just to be clear, my office is somewhat limited because of there's confidentiality rules. And so I, there's, only, there's only so much that I can um, effectuate in terms of change within an individual case, but to the extent that I'm able to help, please reach out. Um, so you could send uh, an email to, it's just, it's just my first initial, last name, um, slevin at council.nyc.gov. Um, and if you, uh, I don't know if you're um, familiar with Joyce, Joyce knows how to, how to reach me as well. Okay, yes, Joyce is my, my, my good best friend. Yes, she's been yeah. with me. Joyce, been Joyce, knows, Joyce knows how to get me. Okay. Thank you. You got it, thank you. Thank you, Diwan. I am going to call on the other individual listed as Joyce McMillan with a hand raised. Hi, yes, my name is Desiree Wright. Uh, I am also a, a parent affected by ACS. Um, I've been dealing with ACS since I was 17 years old. I'm currently dealing with ACS again. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a member of, of parent Parent Legislation Action Network. I also interned for MFP. In December of 2020, my son, um, my son aged 25 and my husband got into a loud argument. The police were called to both, to, were called and both were arrested and released within hours with a limited order of, with a limited order of protection, uh, order of protection, uh, not to menace one another in the apartment. I have a five-year-old, I have a five, my five-year-old was, was in the bed sleep. And um, after my, after my son and husband returned to the apartment together, a few hours later at 1.30 in the morning, ACS knocked on my door. I did not want to let them in. So they threatened to call the police. I did not want the police called back back as whenever a black person interacts with the NYPD, it can go wrong and someone can end up dead. Not knowing my rights, I let them in. They woke up my child and strip searched him uh, for marks and bruises. The worker told my husband he had to move out immediately when we refused, um, she took us to court. This was at the height of the pandemic and he had nowhere to go. We refused because the argument had nothing to do with me or, with me or, with me or him. It only had something to do with him and my son. I was not indicated responded or anything on the case. Um, it went to court and uh, the removal, the article 10 removal uh, was not, 
it was it was it was it wasn't it was meaningless um but i am going through uh the safe way forward program which is another mandated program that uh that works with acs sorry you're on mute You were off for a sec. You were off mute for a second. Now you're back on. Now I can, can hear you. Can you hear me okay. now? Yes. I am yes. with that program, the safe, the safe way forward program. Um, I still don't feel safe with them as um they are still mandated to tell um ACS anything about me. Um I just don't feel like ACS is uh is needed in my life as to the case that had nothing to do with me, but I'm going through all these uh measures. Um, my son has to go through screening. My five, my five year old is it's just crazy. I wish I had known my rights. I wish I had been mem Miranda rise. Um, I wish that uh, legislation passed. Legislation passed for parents to know their rights. Um, I'm also a student. Um, I graduated um, from Hostos Community College, college with honors in um, criminal justice. I'm pursuing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to John Jay after. Um, you can I you just, can finish your testimony. Okay, I'm going to John Jay after. Um, I just don't feel the need that that ACS should be in anybody's lives at this time, at all. From 17, they have traumatized my son. I have a my son is 22, 23 now, and um, has been traumatized by ACS when I was 17 years old. Um, that's all I have to say. I, I just think ACS should be abolished. I don't think they help families. I don't think, I know they don't help families. They have traumatized my, my whole family. And now I'm dealing with them with my five-year-old and I'm, I'm not even an indicated, uh, I'm not even the indicated person. Thank you um, for your testimony. So, so <clears throat> I'm sorry, right now, uh, Ms. Wright, so right now your five-year-old is, is, is home with you or, or, or not? I think you're on mute again. Miss Wright, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, no, I'm okay. It, is, right now, no, where is your just, son? Yeah, he's right here. That's all I was telling oh, Okay, okay, I'm, okay. Yeah, okay, he's good, here. Good. <laughs> okay, okay. So he's he's still with you. He's still with you. Yes, he's still with me, but I still have to go through a bunch of all of these. Um yeah. I mean, I work and I'm doing everything I have to do, but I have to stop doing that to go through these meetings with ACS. I have people coming into my home, keep checking my home. They check my refrigerator every every time they come, which is always full. They keep, uh, they, he has to get strip searched every time they come through. It's kind of crazy. Like, I, I just can't deal with it. Me and my husband are actually going through this stuff with ACS, he's going through Safe Way Forward program and I'm going to one and we still live in the same household. And I mean, it, it's pointless what they're doing to us. It's, it, to yeah. me, it's pointless. Right, right. an additional stress and trauma. Yes, it adds more stress to the family as well. Yeah. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Wright, I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Desiree. Uh, I am now going to call on Nancy F., who has their hand raised. Talk is ready. You. you can begin, Nancy. Thank you, council members. Thank you, Eden. Thank you, everyone. Um, you know, my name is Nancy Fortunato and I am a member of the Pattern Legislator Action Network. And I am a survivor who was impacted by the child welfare system as we know it as the family regulation system. The family regulation system as we know it disproportionately targets um, people of community of color that are, you know, disparities with the resources that are suffering for disparities in many occasions, not including when the pandemic came. That was like even the worst possible outcome. Um, it's important for the world to understand that there are parents, advocates, and attorneys standing against the system that took generations to build 
while billions, billions of dollars are being poured into this system. Many families have felt the agony of separation, trauma by the same system that claims to keep children safe with no real transparency, no meaningful ways to repair family bonds and no accountability for the harm it has caused and continue to cause. I still can remember the day that I received that first knock on the door. It was like a whirlwind. My children were terrified and I was, the confusion and, fail, and the fear that I felt was unspeakable. And all I could think about was what are my rights and how I was gonna protect my children from this monstrous system. The purpose I'm telling you my story to all is to say that we need to acknowledge that we must create opportunity for families to stay together and parents, they must, they must know their rights. The family Miranda bill is essential for every parent to know what are their rights and it's a tool to build parents up and empower them to do what is best for their family, no matter what we look like, our culture or our gender. Knowing our rights is the social fabric to our society and humanity. Our rights as parents should not be ignored. This is the foundation that we all must stand on. We must fight for justice. We must fight for equality and we must fight for families. That is why the family Miranda bill is so important to us. We can't continue to let this harmful system that we know as the family regulation system that lacks trauma responses practices, stigmatize families and hold family hostage because of what they believe what the parent did was wrong. This is a tool they use in a form of accountability, but the reality is it destroys families. We are, we are mothers and brothers and sisters, just like so many of you that are in today here with us all. And we should be treated with respect and dignity. So I ask if you truly value families, then it's crucial to pass the Miranda Rights Bill Law. And thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak my truth. Thank you so much, Nancy, for your testimony. I am now going to once, I'm gonna call on Joyce McMillan listed here who has a hand raised. Hey guys, it's me again. I'm only coming back because I just wanna bring this to you guys' attention and uh, Mr. Levin, maybe you might wanna speak with me offline afterwards. I'm working with a parent, 20 years old, kicked out of her shelter on Friday night um, because her and her boyfriend had a verbal argument. The boyfriend is on the street. The young lady is now at Covenant House. She has a three-year-old and she's pregnant with her second child. ACS told her to give her baby Friday night to her godmother and that she couldn't have the baby back with her. It's Monday, they have not taken her to court. Because I'm asking them, what are they doing? Now they set a um, family safety conference. Child safety conferences are usually the conferences that happen where they assess the safety because they want to remove the child. They're telling her she can't talk to her boyfriend. Um, she's saying that it was only an argument. There was no physical altercation. Um, and they have this mom terrified to even go get her baby. I just spoke to the case manager at Covenant House and Covenant House is like, she has to bring the baby. You know, it's a mother and child program. So if she doesn't get her child, like if ACS take the baby, mom's gonna be displaced again. And these are the things that they do. This is, this is a Covenant House, this is a Covenant House shelter within the, <clears throat> is this a, Covenant House usually is, is the runaway homeless youth system. Is this, is this, this is not. They also have a is, mother and child program. Mother and child program, homeless, okay. So this for homeless uh, moms, yes. Okay. Um, I'm happy to 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 connect with you um, after the hearing um, in the next uh, today or tomorrow, um, and we can reach out to just make sure that that she has all the resources that she needs and that she's not um, you know being denied any of the kind of she should resources be that would lead to the child's father, and she shouldn't be denied. There's no order of protection, Mr. Levin, um, Council. Mm -hmm. 
11 and there's and there's no court order and there's no anything just ACS doing the absolute most you know why because she does not know her rights let's let's definitely talk in the next uh, day, day or two I'll be around you know how to find me yes sir thank you Joyce thank you and thank you Joyce for I I know um I, I'm, I imagine that, that a number of the people that have testified um, uh, were doing so at your, at your urging and facilitation. And so I appreciate it very much for bringing the cases to this hearing for the record. I'm sorry to confuse the, um, the committee with all the judges okay. who showed up. That's okay. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. As always. That's a wrap, guys. Thank you. Thanks again, Joyce. And at this point, one last call. We've never inadvertently missed anyone that would, who has not testified and would like to testify. You can use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which we will, will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to seven, 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council Dot NYC dot gov. Again, we will accept written testimony for the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing, and you can email that testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Levin, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, everybody that testified at this hearing. Um, I do see this as kind of a first step, um, uh, and I, I would like to uh, do everything I can in the next six months before I leave office um, to um, to incorporate a lot of these lessons um, into policy moving forward. And, and so I do ask that everybody that uh, testified, um, if they wish, um, to uh, to join with us in that effort. I greatly appreciate everybody taking time uh, today. And with that, at 2:41 p.m., this hearing is adjourned.